What is up, wrestling fans? Welcome to episode number 632 of the Smart Out Moment Smack Talk Podcast Hot Tags of the Week, where we will be breaking down all the things that we feel like talking about that happened in the world of pro wrestling over the past few days. We got TV recaps. We've got some new names for some different groups in pro wrestling. We got predictions for a couple of events. We got a wedding to talk about. We got all sorts of things under the umbrella this week. I am your host, as always, Tony Mango. Joining me, as always, are Robert E. Felice. Hello. And Callum Wiggins. Hey there. And as always, everybody, I want you to leave your thoughts in the comments below as we are going along here and telling you what we think. We want to know what you have to say. So while you are over there on YouTube dropping those comments, make sure you click on all the good buttons that you see on there, like the thanks button, the like button, the join button, the subscribe button. All that stuff is all great ways to help us out. The join button gives you access to the same tiers as the Patreon does. Darkcast here this week. Uh, we uploaded one of those, and I actually have that on the $5 tier as opposed to the $10 dark cast tier. Just giving people a little bit of a kind of like a New Year's break in that kind of fashion. But pick a poison. You could always make sure that we do something that we haven't necessarily put on the schedule yet. And even a dollar a month goes a long way in helping us out. But if you want to pick up some merchandise, Redbubble and TeePublic are where you can find that. For Smart Cut Moment, Fanboys Anonymous, and A Mango Tees, it all funnels back to me. All of those taxes get taken out and the pennies that I get in return go towards keeping the domain name up and everything like that. And, uh, you know, all your support's greatly appreciated on that front and elsewhere, including just listening to this episode and clicking on the share button, passing it around to people you think might be interested. Make sure you hit that like button, as I mentioned, that's completely free. And we should just uh, get started rolling on with this one. Um, We do have quite a bit to talk about here. Let's talk about this totally oddball scenario. Start getting into, you know, one of the, the weirder hot tags of the week. There was a person in the crowd for uh, an event recently that had a sign that said, Cody, will you be the best man for my wedding? Or, yeah, whatever the phrasing was. That's, you know, I'm ad-libbing that. And Cody agreed to be the guy's best man. And he's since talked about it afterward in a couple of little interviews saying he doesn't know the guy's name. He still hasn't gotten the information and all. So I don't know how they're really going to necessarily do this, but uh, I liked hearing, uh, I saw the, like, the footage afterward where he got, grabbed the microphone and he's like, all right, I got a couple questions. Number one, have you ever been convicted of a felony? Because <laughs> it's like, yeah, you need to know this kind of information and can you do it on a weekday and whatever. If he goes through with this and it's not something that's like, you know, plans fall through where like WWE steps in and it's like, oh, look, we can't really have you do that, but we can send you some merch or like, you know, some kind of alternative idea. Not only is that really cool for that fan, but hey, it's just another sign of like Cody continually trying to put it out there as like, I want to be that type of guy. And that's pretty awesome. How do you guys feel about that? Well, he said it in an interview with Sports Illustrated recently. He's like, no, the next goal is I want to be the face of this company. I want to be who everybody thinks about when they think of WWE. And he's just, I know somebody, I think it was for the end of the year awards, got pissed off at me because I said, Cody just seems like a genuinely good dude, but like he does. And I, this is just another cool moment to me. Um, I don't know, mate. Maybe I'm just a bit jaded about the whole thing and just I'm a bit just nonplussed about it. You just kind of uh, are you thinking that it's like a setup or something? No, I just think that like he just doesn't uh, care about love. You can say it. It's okay. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I mean, yeah, but like it's more just a case of oh, okay, a guy in the crowd said, "Oh, please be my um, best man." It's like okay, and then he'll do it, and it'll just be some random wedding thing. I, I mean, I'd feel a bit like icky about it if he brings like cameras and like records it for like a WWE thing, and they'd like do a whole like little YouTube mini video about the whole experience and everything. Because I feel like, oh, that's a- okay. So you just did it for you know publicity purposes. Well, you know WWE wants to. That's why yeah. that they've already yeah. put out like well, three different videos on it. Well, yeah, I know. So it's just a case of like you actually doing it because you do want to be this guy's best friend. You're just like, oh, yeah, this would be cool. I'll, d- I'll just do it. This guy asked, I'll do it. Or you're doing it because, yeah, I'm man of the people, Cody Rhodes. And I'm like, yeah, that's like, 
it's, like, it's it's saying that someone of his character should be doing. I also think it sets somewhat of a dangerous, not a dangerous precedent, but like it's a precedent for other people in mm-hmm. case of oh, a load of people are going to come out and say like, hey, will you be my best man? Hey, will you be uh, will you my uh, prom attend- date? Or like, yeah, will you attend? Yeah. yeah, will you attend my christening? Or like, <laughs> will, you, will, will you be the priest for my wedding? Or all things like that. And it's like everyone just going, oh, fuck you, Cody. Why did you have to agree to it? Now we all have to agree to this stuff. Otherwise, we look like ourselves. See, I think that there's obviously there's going to be many more people that are going to try that, but that WWE is probably going to make the one exception for this and just be like, look, we the, no, we can't make this a regular thing. I think on like the benefit of the doubt, I think that Cody legitimately is just like, hey, let me try to do this. That'd be kind of like fun and interesting. And then WWE steps in and goes like, well, we got to film it. We got to maximize this. Like, you can't do this for free, damn it, you know? But, um, you know, if you had to, or, or if you got the option or whatever, not necessarily had to, if you could get somebody as your best man for your wedding in pro wrestling, let's just go back in time, like pick somebody that obviously doesn't necessarily like on the roster now or whatever. Anybody that comes to your mind that you would be like, this would be a fun best man or this would be such a train wreck that I couldn't pass it up. I don't know why you would sabotage your own wedding like that, but uh, that would be a great best man. Ah, that'd be a good one. Oh, yeah. That'd be really fun. Yeah. For that matter, our truth, <laughs> he'd show up and he'd be like, I'm ready for Halloween. <laughs> Well, I, I, I couldn't think, really do that. Could for mine since mine was on Halloween. Never, <laughs> never mind. <laughs> I think I, I, I'm, I'm kind of serious. This one, I think I'm joking, but uh, John Moxley mm. would be a great best man. I think that he has he, he gives across that sort of like him or like Eddie Kingston. They both give that level of like they'll take it super seriously and they'll cut a cut a promo style best man speech, and I think that'd be fun. I think in that same vein, I think Claudio would be a lot of fun, like. I could see that being just like a real experience. Like, and he'd make sure the bachelor party was a <laughs> good time. And same goes for probably Adam Cole. Like Adam Cole would be a lot of fun. I'd say if you, if you, unless you are marrying a fellow wrestling fan, definitely wouldn't get MJF to do it. <laughs> He's just uh, steals the, the bride and everything. <laughs> Well, he cuts a promo reason. about how um you know he's a great man like you know i'm really happy to see him uh, get married and all but i'm better than him and you know it. <laughs> right, either like, that or he <clears throat> the bride a pig or something or, yeah. or just like <laughs> she like takes a look at her and goes mid all right yeah. <laughs> same vein I, I think it'd be really fun and i know he's actually like capable of doing this having mcfoley mm-hmm. actually be the one to marry you would be a lot of fun Mick Foley was one of the first ones that popped in my mind because I'm a very sentimental person. So to me, getting somebody that says very like sweet and comforting things and all uh, would be a priority. And Mick Foley is definitely one of those types of guys. A friend of mine got a um, million dollar man to marry him a couple years oh, yeah. ago. Uh, John, I was talking to him, uh, the one like, you know, way back in the day. And he was just like, yeah, I got Ted DiBiase to marry me. And I was just like, what? Like, and he's like, yeah, he, you know, he can, he, he's uh, ordained and paid for him to do that and all. So everyone's got a price. Yeah, he yeah. pretty much does. <laughs> and yours truly will be marrying somebody in June. I'm going to get ordained in the, the meantime. Get the hell out of here. That's- I am going to be marrying Kaylin and Jody. Oh, well, that's awesome. They, uh, Kalen called me up the other day and he's like, Hey, I got a, I got a, I got an idea. Uh, I want to run by you and whatever. And I'm like, yeah, of course. Like whatever. So I'm going to join that club too. Big E, I think, uh, I think Big E has it where he can marry people too. Right. I think he got ordained a couple years ago. That'd be really fun. Like Big E would be a lot of fun for that. Yeah. And he'd be a fun best man too. Like the whole new day, like that whole experience. mm -hmm. Kofi and Woods and all just have three best men. (laughs) Just like, and then it's like it's uh it's your day and it's also the new day yeah that'd be a lot of fun cody uh seems a cool dude though and um i'm glad for this fan i'm assuming that his wife is down for this <laughs> and it's not just like this one guy's just kind of like well i've got cody Rhodes here and they're gonna film it whatever and his wife's gonna be like god damn it dude i don't even care about wrestling because that would be really awkward if it's that's just a, it's just a well, maybe that's set, why so he like- hasn't gotten back to cody Maybe <laughs> they had a big argument after that. It's just a whole trap where it, it said that, like he's going to just pull a switcheroo and he's going to be marrying Cody Rhodes instead. 
Yeah. Yeah, he's going to be uh, the um, the whole like uh, minister or priest or whatever like that they have set up for this. going to be like, do you take this woman, whatever? And he's going to be saying, I do, while looking at Cody. And he's like, no, 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 I was looking at Cody. We're married now. <laughs> Well, congrats to that couple, and I'm curious to see where this and uh, goes and how this all plays out and all. But I guess probably sometime in the future we're gonna have some YouTube video or you know some kind of pop up on like a uh, raw being like, and over this past week Cody Rhodes did this or something like that. So we'll talk about it when it pops up. Jobs later. got married in Vegas. I don't know if we talked about that, but she got married and then she was still like wrestling like at wrestling the in the wedding dress. <laughs> Yeah, which is like that's pretty badass. And I it's very shotsy too. Yeah, it's it's very uh, on brand for her. <laughs> uh let's see, let's bounce to another uh, kind of oddball topic here. Let's go to OVW. Uh Mickey James, you guys had told me this right before we got started. We were trying to figure out what other hot tags to add on here. Mickey James is the creative director, head of female talent, and an executive producer for OVW now, which is pretty awesome. And, you know, I don't know exactly what she is like behind the scenes and all, but she's a veteran. She's been around for a long time. I got a feeling she probably knows quite a bit about the business that she could apply for this in a way that would make her a really good option for it. That's awesome for Mickey. Yeah, I love that. I think great. Mickey, I think this is great for women's wrestling. OVW seems like one of those it's always just there kind of promotions. And they had that Netflix limited series that I still haven't watched. Yeah, I haven't watched it either. I I turned it on. I watched about 30 seconds of it and then I was like, oh, I don't have time to do this. I gotta do something else. And then I completely forgot about it. Yeah, so I, I think it's great. I think more promotions like this need to pop up. And developmental territories are always needed. Mickey's fantastic, and she can help mold the future. Yeah, I think there's um, a clear indication that Mickey wants to have a a long term impact on the wrestling business. I mean, she was uh, one of the main people behind the Empower pay per view for NWA, and she's also doing this um, Starcast Starcast Down Under thing. So she's one of the co co promoters of that. So. I think that, yeah, all indications are she's trying to be a long-term guiding light for the future of wrestling, and OBW is a good place to do it. It's a good place for her to return to because she was part of the developmental system in WWE back down in OBW. So, yeah, it's uh, good news for that pro- that promotion to have someone of that uh, stature be a key part of their backstage uh, their backstage area. I still got that urge to merge, but <laughs> you know, uh, if yeah, but they're this is one of the ones that you don't need to merge because it's like, they're not trying to be, we're the biggest company in the world. They're not doing that. Yeah. And you know, you need feeder territories and you know, people work their way from OVW into the bigger promotions. And also they do serve a purpose. It's just, uh, yeah, that part of me, that's like, um, that's always just like, oh, okay, well, if she's doing this role, I would assume she would rather than transition to being like a producer in WWE or a producer for yeah, impact or whatever it might be that she, you know, I don't know what her end goal would be. I doubt it's probably to stay in OVW forever, but at least in the meantime, cool. She gets to mold some talent. She gets to get her feet wet for these kind of gigs and then yeah, transition elsewhere if she wants to. And if not, you know, then she sticks around here forever. I mean, Al Snow's been doing this for how long? For in like over a decade, right? Probably. Yeah. So, yeah. Sometimes uh, that's where you want to stay, and that's that's cool. Whatever her preference is, I doubt for it. I like Mickey. I always think she gets talked about less than she needs to. Uh, let's see. Let's talk about, well, you know, we we're mentioning other promotions and stuff. Let's get into some TNA stuff. Let's talk about the new title belts. And then also this TNA hard to kill pay-per-view. These belts are, they span the range for me of, Oh my God, I absolutely love this. This is one of my favorite belts I've ever seen in any promotion to, Oh, that's ugly. And I don't understand why that's the design they went with. I 
absolutely love the digital media championship. I think that that's such a good belt. Not only is the like the plating really well done, like the the center plate is a good shape because I'm not a fan of like the tall championships that are like that big oval like that um i guess kind of the one that's now but like the old aew women's world championship i really hated that design i don't like the one that they use now either i like it a little bit better than the old one but when they're really like ovular and like kind of like the shape of like somebody's face i don't like that so i don't like the pointy world tag team title design that they've got for instance for the new tna titles just anything that's like that. And the, the TNA world title is a little bit too pointy for my end, but the digital media championship that like, it's not too angular. It's not too round. It's got that, uh, like that grid motherboard kind of texture to it. Yeah. That's a really cool. Element. I think that that's so good. The only thing I don't like about it is the TNA logo being in the middle. Cause I don't like the TNA logo. Oh, uh, they they went all in on like the TNA logo is in the middle of all. This yeah, stuff. but I I like I don't like that TNA logo, and if you replace that with like you know a different promotion like the the AEW, I mean I'm not a big fan of the AEW logo either, but at least like the red doesn't pop out as much, or the WWE logo where it's a little bit more understated. Everything about that digital media championship I love except for that TNA logo, and that's probably like my fifth favorite championship design ever now at this point <laughs> but man that tna x division title that ribbon for the champion thing that's listed it's on there mustache it looks like a mustache yeah exactly it looks like it's a mustache i don't know why they were thinking that as i'm looking at the belts now i'm wondering why the x division title isn't the one that we chose to put a red strap on yeah and of course i've said before i don't like colorful straps so you're just no fun yeah i'm a little fun sometimes but that's not one where i am like that the world tag team title that's the one that i it's the least favorite out of all these it's just that's not my thing um i i don't remember if i've seen the knockouts one up close let me double check to see if there's a better picture from the one that i'm looking at but it's what are you thinking about these uh the x division one's definitely my favorite really Oh, it's definitely, it's like, if the big X in the middle of it, like that's, it's like, that's kind of all you really need to, to really feature. And I think that it's the most standout, it's the most unique looking bell out of all of them. I think they're all, they're all pretty great. I don't really see any of them feel like, oh, this is, this looks awful by any stretch of the imagination. I think they've all, they've, they've put full into them. I do like, they've got the big TNA logo in the middle of it, just about, like, say, yeah, this is the big this is we're back and we're prominently featuring this. Yeah, digital media one looks looks good. I kind of feel like it's too similar to the the old one. So it's pretty much just that with the TNA logo in the middle of it, which is fine. It was a good belt design when they made it. Um, but yeah, I think that I think they're all pretty pretty impressive. So the reason I think that they didn't try too hard to edit the digital media one is because it's the one championship. That the, doesn't have a pre-existing TNA design, so it's still relatively new. Um, the knockouts one is spot on gorgeous. I like that they have the white strap. I was talking to a buddy of mine, and he's like, "I don't know how I feel about the women's titles necessarily being designated the ones that need to have a white strap." And until he had said that, I'd forgotten that that's what WWE does. I just like. The original knockouts title and i think this is a cool callback to that the world title is gorgeous as well and like helm said there's none of these are terrible i would make slight alterations to the x division title that i've already mentioned but other than that these are all great yeah i'd be getting rid of that uh that mustache i would almost like you remember the original nxt title the was- like the big x yeah, like yeah, I would do that. Mm-hmm. I could see that being that. the case. Yeah, no, that old, no, that old one. It was just like really shortly put together. I it's bland one. looking championship that old NXT title. But I could see them like taking that inspiration and having like a big X in the middle. But then it kind of like 
I don't know. Like I look at the little like I don't know what you would really call it. The little flourishes that are in like the background of these things, and the more that I look at the X Division title, the less I like it. Because whatever that little too busy for you, it's not only that it's a little bit too busy. I'm not like generally a fan of a lot of that like the flowery type of design in anything. Like you know, whenever like Caroline and I go to like a Broadway show and we're in like some old theater and it's got like that. The very, you know, like those like flowery patterns all over the place. I'm like, I hate this. They need to go with like, like I like the buildings in New York that look like banks (laughs) that are just like glass sheets and stuff. I don't like the old buildings. I'm very much not tapped into an appreciation of historical uh, things. So I'm on like the complete opposite spectrum from Callum. Callum's like, you know, I'm sure you would appreciate this stuff more like Caroline does. Um but like the thing right. underneath champion in the TNA uh, X division title, like that looks like a scrotum to me. No, I, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. I, I mean, I didn't notice that bit of it as well, but like, but I mean, I like the, the, the little, um, the ribbons with this, like the X division, the world and the world tag team, the champion stuff. Like, I think they've put a lot of effort into making those ribbons look nice. I mean, uh, again, I think I'll probably be maybe on an island with this one, but I really like the way the total non-stop a- action is written. Oh, um, see, I hate that. I knew Tony was gonna hate it. I like it because it's it's creative. I think it looks like a font that you would use for like a, a kids show, like um, what is wrestling? <laughs> like uh, you know, like those those places, like the Discovery Zone. Yeah, uh, no, I got you. Like those, you know, like a little kid's like indoor playground sort of thing. Like I could see that being the case for that. I, I've never liked bulky fonts like that. And yeah, I know I'm getting a little bit into, you know, the, the gun barrel doesn't look right. Oh, and, no, this is you why know. we're here. <laughs> <laughs> but like, uh, you know, I mean, that's, these are all details that they, they go over and they like, they talk about this when they're going through the designs and stuff. So um, somebody out there makes the decision of having like the world title has side plates that have like a rounded curve on the left and right, rather than the pointed side plates from the tag titles or something like somebody out there definitely thinks women's pro wrestling championships need to be like a taller center plate. I think maybe they think that that's like more flattering looking and then, you know, they decided to go with that font for the X on the X division. Like these are all designs that they needed to do, but that mustache, man, that throws me off. It's a mustache on top of a scrotum. (laughs) I'm not a fan of that one. (laughs) Uh, I do love that digital media championship though. That's standing out to me. as like really cool. I like that quite a bit. So yeah, good on them. You know, they, they upgraded for the most part. And I'm so uh, excited for them. I, I tweeted this last night. I really feel like this is, biggest thing that this company has had since maybe the deletion stuff with the Hardys and even that was kind of like silly. This feels important for the industry. This feels like a chance for TNA to be a solid number three and then once you had that solid one, two, and three everything else can start to fall in line and I think that's really needed for the industry. So this is at least supposed to be like the big hurrah of like we're here as TNA now. This event is going to be a major show for them. Hard to Kill is not a show I plan on watching. I'll say that still. I, I You know, I don't plan on spending my weekend uh, doing coverage for this and stuff. They didn't win me over enough for me to want to put that out there. But I will say... I am excited for what potentially can come out of this and for some news, maybe like, you know, we still don't know who that big signing is, but I'm hoping for some good stuff and let's uh, break this down a little bit as much as uh, we can, as far as, you know, me not knowing a goddamn thing about it for the most part, who do you guys think right now heading into this is that big signing? I have no idea. Cause Unless it's like an Osprey thing where Mercedes is going to go to AEW in March, but 
she's gonna stop off and do TNA for a couple months. I I don't have any idea who that could even be. Yeah, I, I, as I say, I can't really predict who is a big enough signing to match up to the level that they've been presenting, but he's still te- he's still currently a free agent. Um, my mind immediately goes to Ali being the signing, just because I feel like out of all the people that have left WWE and haven't found a place to go yet, he is the biggest name. It's definitely not as big as what they were touting, but it would still be a very good signing. So, so yeah, I'd, I'd probably lean towards him at the moment. But, but who knows? Maybe there is someone out there that we're not, that I'm not super familiar with, or other people aren't super familiar with, or someone who's just, you know, gotten lost in the ether a little bit. That's now coming back for whatever reason. But, but yeah, we'll have to wait and see. I think it's going to be Goldberg. Goldberg's an interest would be an interesting one. I think in their mind they're like, "Oh my god, he's like one of the most dominant people out there. He's a legend. We can have him on here. He can get his uh, few yeah. matches that he wants to be like his big send off and all." And I mean, this is the company that brought Ken Jamrock back, so. Mm-hmm. Goldberg would be an amazing signing for them. Let's be honest. If Goldberg went to WWE right now. He'd be fighting Roman again. Like, that's a huge signing for them. Yeah, it, 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 I think I'd be surprised if it was Goldberg, but like, not like, oh my God, that's an amazing signing, but it's more of a case of, I, I assume he just, he would need to be retiring or he's just waiting for a call from either AEW or WWE. I don't think he'd go to Impact or TNA. But, um, be able well, to. Depending on how much they pay for him, because um, oh, yeah. isn't that the whole thing that they had set aside a whole lot of money? Yes. Yeah, so as, as well, the the, um, the story is that they made a seven figure offer to Will Ospreay. Mm-hmm. So and they made a similar offer to Punk. Yeah. So presumably they can they can make those offers to people. It's just um, whether they'd be willing to do that for Goldberg or whether Goldberg for, for Goldberg that's enough to. Because at the end of the day, TNA is as much as it is exciting that they've got the name back and they seem to have built up a lot of hype for this show. You're still probably going to be wrestling in front of like 200, 300 people every single week on the in the Impact <laughs> show. So, so whether that's enough to entice someone in for it, then we'll see. But yeah, at the moment, I'm leaning towards Ali. I know I've seen reports out there saying that um, they're expecting at least at least one former WWE superstar to be debuting or appearing on the show. Well, AJ Francis is supposed to be on there, top dollar. Uh, I guess he's he promoting. To be, he will be. He's going to be promoting some song of his or whatever. Oh, great. So maybe yeah, that's the person that, like, that they're like okay, the former person. You know? It's so funny because he's going to be there with DJ Who Kid and DJ Who Kid. So far, is the only person who's given us some kind of a take on brawling. So, I mean, AJ Francis is there, and he can do something for TNA, I'm sure. But I still don't uh, even know what DJ who I don't know who he is. First off, because for I don't follow musicians and stuff to begin with, let alone current music. But I read a report about like what he had said, and I'm like, I still don't know anything about what he said. Like the whoever had written it out, they wrote it out pretty much like verbatim, I guess, of what he had said. And I'm like, I don't know what he's revealing. Wait, it, <laughs> it sounded yeah, like wait. it was like, oh man, people are fighting, and then they're like fighting because they were fighting, whatever. And I'm like, so he's not saying anything, right? Or did he like what? say something more that I just didn't get in my translation out of it? As as far as I saw it, it was basically he said the punk went off to Jack Perry and there was there was blood involved in the altercation. Uh he, he said the big Hawaiian dude went and broke it up, which is referring to Samoa Joe. <laughs> um and then he said that Tony Khan was like screaming at Punk saying you're ruining this, get out there and fucking wrestle. See, because the funny thing about that is if you read the actual transcription by Jeremy Lambert on Fightful, it clarifies that Samoa Joe is the one who said, get the fuck out there and All wrestle. Because right. that sounds a lot more believable to me. But, you know, that is the closest thing we've had to kind of 
take on it. And <laughs> you already know what happened in the back. It was straight brawl city. I'm not going to talk about that. Blood and killing and death. You might as well say it. I was right there. We were next. They put us to be ready to go. Like right then, it's like that doesn't say anything at all. And then it was crazy. It's ongoing. They told me this has been an ongoing. That was the last straw. It was the big, the biggest moment for AW, and I guess he was trying to sabotage that moment. So he being Punk or Perry? Oh, my Punk. He wasn't that trying reason. to go out there. <laughs> I'm in the middle. I'm a fly on the wall. It was very intense. I always thought it was fake and all this shit. It's more real. It was wrestling back there. A DDT, everything. I'm exaggerating. <laughs> like... <laughs> There was a yelling moment where he was like, fuck this shit. This is our moment. Everybody get the fuck out here and do your shit. I was like, I don't wrestle, but I was about to go out there. It was very intense. I will always respect wrestling after I saw that. So, like, none of this actually reveals almost anything. It reveals that Smojo's the fucking man, and that's why Smojo's the current world champion, I think. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, AJ Francis is going to be there to do something with that. If anybody's actually into, like, Top Dollar's music video or something, cool. <laughs> but let's go into this card itself. I'm going to read this for the first time here because I have no clue what's on this card. So there's a pre-show. There are three pre-show matches, it seems. Rich Swan against Steve Macklin. Wasn't Steve Macklin the champion, like, last pay-per-view? Not last pay per view. It was a good, it was a good like year, year ago. Yeah. Uh, that, that goes to show you how much uh, I pay attention to. So he's been relegated from being a champion to eventually downgrading to a pre show match. That sucks. I'm That's not actually sure a rich why. one, really. I, well, yeah, actually, he's got a point. <laughs> um, I'm not sure why this is on the pre show, but I guess it's because there's no titles on the line or anything. It's, I think Macklin will win. They're currently out of kind of rotation in terms of being like top guys in it. I don't think Macklin's probably going to be at Impact much. Well, going to be in TNA forever anyway. Like the honors now in, in AEW, so I think you might try and angle to get a job there as well. But, um, but yeah, I'd say that Macklin will probably win because he's the more he's still currently the more pushed out of the two. Eddie Edwards and Brian Myers against Eric Young and Frankie Kazarian. So this is just like you know, the veterans throw them on the card. Pretty much. Yeah. I imagine Young and Kazarian will win because they're TNA originals. So is Edwards, right? No. Not the way that the other two are. Hmm. He's a Ring of Honor. He's a ring, you'd, you'd more refer to him as a Ring of Honor original, really. So. Uh, he came there. No. And I, there is a, a digital media championship match. No DQ, Tommy Dreamer against Crazy Steve. I have not seen a single Crazy Steve match ever. I'm just thinking about that, that. Um, I mean, Or if I have, this, I don't remember it. <laughs> I mean, this isn't particularly exciting because it's Tommy Dreamer wrestling in 2024. Mm. So it's like, and he's a champion going into this as well. So what, like he should have retired like 20 years ago, let alone that like 10 years ago mm -hmm. uh he's not that old what is he like just hitting his 50s now yeah but he feels it he's yeah, 52 he, really does. he does feel it i'll give you that like he, he's 52 now so he's a similar age to like jericho but you just don't you don't you don't feel the same with like jericho as, as it does with tommy dreamer i guess it's because dreamers made kind of no effort to keep it in shape or anything like that are they gonna have to play tommy dreamer's theme throughout the whole time like they did with jericho <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that happened this week that's funny i mean i mean realistically i'll go with like just crazy steve winning just so you have like a title change early on if people are watching on the pre-show and it's going to convince them to sign up maybe a title change would do the job for them but but yeah i'd, I'd probably go with that it's just across the board i would assume that most championships are probably changing hands yeah i'm gonna go with uh crazy steve winning I would too. Without having any knowledge of this, I would lean more towards title change. Same when it comes to the four way for the world tag titles. So, A, B. So, why do they go by ABC? Chris Bay and Ace Austin. Is there a reason why they go by ABC other than just like they've got two A's, a C, and a B in their names? Well, it's it's it comes with the fact that they're both Bullet Club members. 
so it's ABC is like the BC stands for Bullet Club. Yeah, a, a you know Bullet Club, and also a, a way to not constantly be like Bullet Club's on this show, so that you're not hyping up fans unnecessarily. So what's the A stand for if the B and C are Bullet Club? The, it's the Austin and Bay connection. Oh, so it's, it's, it's Austin and Bay connection, but like ABC, a, also, like, but it's also, also, also to reference the Bullet Club thing, huh. and it's also they do the ABC, the one two sweet. Like it's there's many different meanings. They've landed on ABC. Hmm. Uh, ABC against the Rascals, Speedball Mountain. <laughs> That's kind of funny that they decided to go with that. And the Grizzled Young Veterans. Cool. Uh, Gibson and Drake win this. I'm gonna guess Gibson and Drake. I'm gonna get if there's a title change that hands, it's Gibson and Drake. If not, I think the champions. I'd be surprised if Gibson and Drake win just because they're not gonna be signed with TNA probably. They're probably just they're still touring around and doing a lot of independence and loads of other stuff. So I I don't think they would put the titles on a team that's not going to be well. They would probably come in for other shows, but they're not going to be a permanent fixture there. So I think that I think they'll keep it on ABC for this one. Um, I feel I feel a bit uh, unfortunate that Mike Bailey's been relegated to just a fatal four way tag team match rather than having a more prominent match on this show. Where do you think you'd put them? Um, I mean, I'd I'd rather see him face Alex Shelley for the world title than Moose. We'll say that say, say that much. But um, yeah, I mean, I I'd, I'd be up for him fight for the world title. We had the best match in Impact last year with Will Ospreay. Obviously, everyone has the best match in every promotion with Will Ospreay, but it's the case of. Uh, but yeah, but Mike Bailey had that match with him, so I think that they should they should capitalize on that and say, hey, why aren't we pushing this guy towards even the X Division or world titles? Well, there is an Ultimate X match, Knockouts Ultimate X match, that I'm seeing here. Number one contender for the Knockouts world title. This is Giselle Shaw, Zaya Brookside, Jody Threat. I don't think I've ever heard her name before, Tasha Steeles, Alicia Edwards, and Danny Luna, former uh, NXT UK as well. Uh, I wouldn't have the slightest idea who is in line for a uh, world title shot. <laughs> Jody Threat is a very kind of important figure for at least like my particular fandom is the fact that it was the match that she had with Athena on AEW Dark that set Athena onto the path that she's currently on, which is the more aggressive side of things. She had that super aggressive match with Jody Threat, which I think there were reports about it like actually getting like properly like heated or like there was some like actual shots taken in that one. And so, so yeah, Jody Threat's a like pretty um regular name on the independent circuit the ones that are kind of very familiar to tna are giselle shaw tasha Steele, alicia edwards danny luna's coming in for this one i don't know whether she's permanently signed i think so it's, in- it's interesting that she's there and uh subculture aren't they are uh, aren't they they're not well they're not on the show oh but i think i do think they're signed i think yeah. one of them might still be heard okay i think uh Webster might be hurt. I mean, the one I would be most interested in winning this is Brookside because she's been, she's only recently kind of come back into wrestling after um, she said she got married and there was an injury issue as well that kept her out for a lot of 2023 because she started 2023 in uh, stardom but then got injured and so her tour ended like prematurely there. And yeah, so hopefully she can come back and start off well here. Um, I think the most likely winner is probably going to be Tasha Steeles, just because of who also is potentially going to win the uh, Knockouts World Championship. But realistically, it could be any of them outside of Alicia Edwards, because it's probably not going to be Alicia Edwards, because it never really is Alicia Edwards. <laughs> Josh Alexander is going up against Alex oh, Hammerstone. Well, I, didn't say who I, oh, didn't I thought you did it already. Um, I think it's going to be Gis- Giselle Shaw, but Tasha Steeles would be a great shout. And I think she's one of the best in the business. And, but she already won the last Women's Ultimate X. So I'm guessing we go with Giselle. We got between uh, Hammerstone and Alexander. Is how Hammerstone signed? Not them? yet, but motherfucker, he should be. The Hammerstone is a big dude and he looks great. And if he's not ready for that AEW level, 
I think TNA should try to lock him up, and this should be a great match. I've been like, hearing his name a lot, but I don't know anything about him. Because he's not signed, I'm going to say uh, Alexander probably gets the win. Is he like it. a total free agent? Or is he yeah, like he just, uh, just kind of on loan? He yeah, left, left out of So, um, yeah, I'd say that, um, oh, it depends. If he is signed permanently, it'd be a good scout for him to beat Josh Alexander, but maybe it's just a, like, kind of the initiation match almost. And you have Josh Alexander get the victory over the non signed guy because Alexander will still get pushed towards the world title if he's sticking around for long term. Yeah, I'd say that this is probably a good place to Hammerstone. I just, I don't think that AEW would, there's no room for a guy like that, I don't think. So I think that if he wants to be positioned in a, a prominent enough place and gets consistent time on TV, then then TNA is probably his best, his best bet. So this is basically just like a match to feature Josh Alexander where they had nothing else for him to no, do. Or... This is a match to feature both of them because right now I think they're trying to be the place that everybody wants to go. That's why you know you also have Okada coming and Osprey. He's going to do one more show there. Um, I think this is a a really cool match, and I think it's going to be really good. It might be one of the better matches on the show, honestly. Oh yeah, that's probably another reason why Alexander's going to win because he's because he's going to have the match of Osprey again. So I think they'll try and obviously try and keep him strong in the build up to that match of Osprey. So. Is there like a feud going on with the Indies or is it just a match? Well, they've I mean, had, they had their first match. It's a, a feud of, based on respect kind of thing. Yeah. Alexander basically. and Hamilton, Hammerstone? No, uh, no. Oh, no, no, no. Alexander and Osprey. Hammerstone's yeah. just, oh shit, he's a free agent. Let's get him. So they just said like, this match is on the card. It's not like yeah. they set up like a story. Barely any story for any of these. Tina hasn't run any shows since Final Resolution in December. So then, why are they doing Dirty Dango versus PCO and they've got Vladimir Kozlov alongside? Vladimir Kozlov Dango? is permanently with TNA. And has been for <laughs> about two, three months now. And they just like, they looked back and like way back in the. Uh, uh, who do we have from you know, 2011 or whatever? Like, kind of. He's Dango Security. When was he like prominently featured in WWE? 2008. Wow. Oh, eight. And they're just like coming around to bringing him in now. Like that's odd. I mean, to be fair, he became a champion in WWE around about like 2011, tw- like 2010, twenty. But I'm thinking of the version of him that just like pinned the Undertaker on SmackDown. And no yeah. one talks about it. Even still, though, I mean, when he was a tag champ with Santino, it was, right? They yeah. uh, they won in, like, 2011 or so. So if that's the case, it's, like, wait, like 12, 13 years. Mm. But it's Dirty Dango against PCO. What's happening there? Wrestling's happening there, too. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, I don't know if you'd even call it wrestling in this match. but like, Well, yeah, Dango just- hates wrestling. PCO won't die. And... They're kind of, it's kind of just your fun match, I think. Yeah, I imagine it's going to be comedy laden. I think it's one of those ones that, you know, starts off as a singles match, but then someone does something and so they turn it into a hardcore match and then we just go from there, really. Not, not one that I think uh, people should be anticipating. It's more like a bathroom break match. I mean, I, I mean, I'd be taking it at that point in time. So if other people want to do so, they're more than welcome to. But, uh, but yeah, this is this is probably the uh, the least interesting match out of all of them. Hmm. Uh, Saban is up against Kushida and Vikingo for the X Division title. Vikingo yeah, could get that belt, but I would assume that they're going to go with Kushida. So Kushida is signed with right. TNI, so it would make a lot of sense for him to win it here because he is. He's still an excellent wrestler and can definitely be an excellent next division champion, be like a staple for that as well. But so could Saban, and Saban has been doing that for quite a while now. So, yeah, I I think it's kind of a bit of a toss up between those two about who wins. I don't think, I think the King goes just there to do his thing, have a great match, do a lot of cool spots. But there to flip. Yep. Yeah. 
And uh, but yeah, I think that it'll be either be Saban pinning Kushida or Kushida uh, tapping out Saban, one way or the other. But uh, but yeah, I think that uh, I, I, it guns my head. I'd say Kushida wins the title. But I'm going with Saban, but I would I wouldn't mind seeing uh, Kushida or Vikingo win. Vikingo is what the X Division was fucking founded on. You know what I mean? Like just nonsense for the sake of nonsense. So I'd be okay with anybody winning here. Trinity, who is by all accounts leaving the company and probably going to be in the Royal Rumble, is defending the Knockouts World Title against Jordan Grace. Uh, this Wikipedia has this labeled out as this is Grace's Call Your Shot Championship match. What uh, so what she, happened? She to won that? the Gauntlet. Go ahead, go. Yeah, she won a Gauntlet match. It's a fun resolution to. Was it fun re- oh yeah, Bound for Glory to um to earn a any title shot that she so chose, and she went after the the Knockouts Championship. Because it was a uh, it was an intergender gauntlet match hmm. that she won, so um, so yeah, they, so she's going after Trinity and she'll win the title here because yeah, this is this, this the most uh, easy to predict one of all. It's I'm really sad that Trinity is just going to go back to WWE. She's doing great shit here. Like, I kind of want to see this run continue. Yeah, Naomi and the Rumble will be great, and people will pop, and we'll feel the glow, and yay. But there's more we can do with Trinity, and I hope that she gets more done when she goes back to WWE. I mean, I'd mean, I say, like, realistically, Trinity's going back to WWE and isn't going to do anything. I am aware of what's about to happen, Cal. Yeah. Because she's about, she's about to get thrown into a nothing tag team for a WrestleMania Fatal 4-Way match. Mm-hmm. Can we, can we place bets on with who? Uh, who's glowing? She's um, she's not gonna be with like a Shotzi bloodline thing for anybody who goes like, well, she's gonna be put into the blood. It's not gonna happen. Like she's not gonna be paired with uh, Nia Jax to be a part of this thing or something. She's gonna be in like some baby face feel the glow thing. Like you know, y- y- Shotzi is a good potential option for that. Uh, I'm gonna go with Meechin. Meechin's <laughs> really strong option. Um, sorry, did, everybody, for the um, coughs. I'm still coughing, obviously. <laughs> she did fight me I mean, impact for the title, so I guess it, you could kind of build it off that um, Off that. Story. I'd like to see her in the bloodline. I mean, the, that ship has sailed, but whatever. You're still insistent on doing the bloodline. I'd like to see something happen there. I definitely think she's going to end up popping up on SmackDown. And... For anybody who goes straight to like, oh, she's going to win the Royal Rumble and she's going to challenge it. No, she's not. <laughs> it's not happening. Uh, I could potentially see her trying to do something on Raw, though. Like, there are more people on Raw, so maybe she could be paired off with one of them. But they did a thing this week where they had like, I think it was this week. Maybe it was last week. And I'm blurring on it, but I think it was this week where they showed like, these are our women's tag teams. And they were in the back. They were watching. It was like Maxine Dupree and Ivy Nile. Because uh, in the ring, it was Caden Carter and uh, Katana Chance. And it was Chelsea Green and Piper Niven. So they had like Candice and Indy, Ivy and Maxine, Natty and Tegan, and Shayna and Zoe. Which pretty much covers everybody from the Royal roster outside of like, you know, Becky's by herself. Liv Morgan's injured. Nia Jax is solo re ripley solo nikki cross was missing from there but i can't see nikki being a tag team with uh trinity and then raquel's mia right now uh sonya's mia with her injury valhalla she's here but uh Zyla is the only other one so it's like it makes more sense for her to go to smackdown and you know maybe yeah maybe she teams up with tamina you haven't done anything with tamina in a long Nobody time tamina. and she's still there Technically, yeah, but I, I think we're I think we're looking at Meechin and uh, Naomi. That's unfortunate. I'm sorry. Like I, I like what Trinity's doing. She's headlining shows here. <laughs> and then Alex Shelley world title match against Moose. This is a so feast or fired. My being, I don't want Moose to win here, but I got to tell you, I think Moose is winning here. As a complete outsider, I agree. I think that it's very unlikely that they're going to end this show with. Well, actually, I was just going to say they're they're not going to end this show with just Alex Shelley retains the title and that's it. But 
maybe their plan is to have whoever that big name is come out and challenge Alex Shelley. That is the way I see it as well. It could still be that they challenge Moose, though. But I think it's going to be Moose. Yeah, like it could be like Moose standing in the ring and Goldberg comes up and is like, you know. That's exactly what I was going to say. I I could see the Goldberg thing then. Yeah, I mean, I think if if the big signing is someone like Goldberg, then yeah, it makes sense that Moose would be the champion. I don't realistically see Goldberg versus Alex Shelley being a match for the (laughs) world championship. (laughs) Why but, not? Uh, like, I mean, I, I would personally rather see Alex Shelley win just because I, I've never got Moose. I don't know why he's considered a big deal and a, a main event level talent. Like, is he still there? Well, yeah, but like, even, even even when he's like he started out, I don't know. I didn't really see anything in Moose. He definitely but, got better, but he's definitely like, it's very old style. You know, like he's somebody who I would have accepted in WWE and like. During the Ryback days, you know, he also does one of my least favorite moves, which is the flipping spear. I hate what do you mean the spear. flipping spear? Like I mean, when, I mean, I mean when, yeah, yeah, spear. yeah. I mean, when they hit the spear and they flip forward while hitting the spear, like Bobby Lashley does occasionally. So they do like they hit the spear and then do a front flip, landing on their their back, or and the and the guy goes down. It's like. It just ruins all the impact of the sphere because yeah. you're 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 losing momentum by flipping forward afterwards. It's uh, so yeah. Uh, I mean, I'd rather have actually win, but it's probably more likely that Moose gets the victory. So we we'll, uh, we won't be doing our pay per view point coverage <laughs> for that, but anything that happens coming out of it, we'll address on the hot tags or something for next week. Let's switch over to the New Japan side of things. Now, I don't know uh, what events this was, but uh, Callum had mentioned prior to this, matches being revealed for the upcoming shows, but then we also have Battle in the Valley to talk about. So take it away, Callum, because you are much more equipped at bringing that down than I am. <laughs> well, let's do Battle in the Valley then, because that's taking place on the same on the same day as a, as a hard to kill. Yes, so. So let's run down the matches then. So we've got the kickoff match. Um, so this is a match between Matt Vandergriff and Goldie. Now, I'm not super familiar with these two, but I believe they're both uh, part of the LA Dojo. They're just young boys from the American side of things for New Japan. So I guess it's just, hey, let's just put these two together and see how they how they get on. Uh, so I couldn't I can even... Think, think to guess which one of those two is going to win because I don't know anything about either of them. Vandergriff. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Yeah, yeah, I would. I wouldn't hazard a guess either. They're young boys. <coughs> uh, the second kickoff match is is Viva Van versus Stephanie Vicare, which is quite interesting because uh, Stephanie Vicare was part of that um, original tournament to crown the first New Japan Strong Women's Champion. Viva Van has been making a bit a bit of a name for herself on the independent circuit. Um, I think that they will go with Viva Van on this one, but like realistically it could be either of those two and they it, it, either of those two could win it and then immediately later on in the night come out and challenge the winner of the New Japan Strong title match. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna go with Stephanie, but I can see it going either way and then them being the next challenger. Uh, no idea. So, yeah. <laughs> First official match. So we have uh, Shota Umino, Fred Rosser, and Jacob Fatu versus Team Filthy of Tom Lawler, Roy, Royce Isaacs, and Jarrell Nelson. Um, I mean, Shota's the biggest star out of this group in terms of a New Japan context, but, you know, they, they actually have the team connection of Team Filthy, which might be the benefit to them. Like Fred Rosser and Tom Lawler have basically been feuding for feels like two years at this point, just to like on and off. There's built up to me more of like a feud of respect now. Jacob Fatu is an interesting person to throw into this as well, like an MLW guy who probably is looking at his uh wherever his next destination is. Um, I mean, I'd probably go with the baby faces winning, but again, this is kind of like a bit of a toss up. This one, I'm gonna go baby faces. Uh, next up, we have uh, Mascara Dorada, which is the former uh, Grand Metal League 
and Volador Jr. against Rocky Romero and Soberano Jr. Uh, this is going to be very, very... Um, it, it's kind of like previewed as a preview of the um, CMLL uh, Fantastic Mania Tour that's coming to New Japan soon. So this is just going to be a very Lucha-style match. Um, Soberano Jr. was doing some stuff at the uh, the New Japan Tag League, so I think that like they have they see a lot of promise in him and he's teaming up with Romero and Romero's basically just doing everything in every promotion outside WWE right now. So um again, toss up. I think there's at least been some reports about Mascara, Mascara Dorada not exactly being happy about taking jobs or losing matches too often. So mm-hmm. maybe him maybe him and the uh, Volador will get the victory here. Because Rocky Romero never has an issue with taking pinfall, so it seems to be a thing that happens a lot with Lucha guys. Um, but I agree with you, Rocky Romero has no problem looking up to the lights. So I'm going to say Mascara Dorada. Uh, next up, TJP versus David Finlay. David Finlay is the current global global uh, championship cha- champion. So yeah, he'll beat TJP, even if TJP does wear his, his silly, stupid mask. <laughs> yeah, the, he's going to beat The Fiend 2.0. The belt's not on the line or anything, right? No, just a match. I bet, so if he's not fighting, is Dolph on this show? Is Nick Nemeth no. on? This show? We'll talk about that later. Uh, he could, but yeah, he's he's going to have a match in New Japan soon. But we'll talk about that in a little while. Cool. Um, yeah, so t- don't think he'll easily win that one. So there's no point in really talking about it. Uh, New Japan Strong Open Weight Tag Team Championship match. So this is just for the Strong Championships, not for both the Strong and the IWG ta- Tag Team Championships, even though they're both held by Gorillas of Destiny, El Fantasmo, and Hikaleo, who are defending against the Bullet Club War Dogs of Alex Coughlin and Clark Connors. What is interesting here is that both Clark Connors and Alex Coughlin have spoken openly about the fact that their contracts are expiring soon. Mm-hmm. As is Gabe Kidd, there's not going to be a lot of war dogs as, if they don't send these people. As is El Fantasma. There's not going to be a lot of uh, <laughs> Bullet Club love here. So, and I know... so, Go ahead. Man, a lot of uh, New Japan talent are well, expiring soon, right? Well, the big story about it is that it's quite obvious that a lot of the talent that we've just mentioned there are all Gaijin talent, which is obviously non-Japanese. The issue with that being is that the yen, the Japanese yen, its economic value has dropped significantly in recent years, meaning that the people that are now getting paid, they're getting paid less than, obviously, what they would have done previously. And obviously, people like Clark Connors, Alex Coughlin, and Gabe Kidd, they would be spending that money in America or in in the UK or other places. So they need to be earning more yen in order to make the money that they would be then spending or using outside of Japan. Because these people don't live in Japan, they they tour Japan, but they live in the US or the or the UK. So, so yeah, it's kind of like there's a big issue at the moment of a lot, them potentially losing a lot of their overseas talent due to the fact that they can't or either can't or are not willing to pay them additional money to counteract the the drop in the yen's value. So. We could see both these guys that are fighting for the titles, and maybe one of the guys that is the current champion, uh, leaving New Japan in the near future. Unless so, who do you head. who do you think is going to end up? Uh, just Gorillas of Destiny retaining, and oh, yeah, then yeah. you know that way they can at least they've got Hikaleo kind of thing. Well, yeah, so I, I, I don't want to like predict to say that they're absolutely going to go other places because then again, it's like where would they go? They're, they're definitely places, but it's not like there's a huge clamor for the for them at this point in time so they might end up re-signing with new japan anyway but it's just it's just interesting that there's a lot more discussion seemingly in the last couple of months or so of people potentially uh they're con- talking openly about their contracts expiring speaking of that julia <laughs> yeah Ju- yeah julia defending the strong women's championship against trisha dora um I'd, I'd said earlier that i think that trisha dora is going to win but i've decided to renege on that and say that i think julia is going to retain here really? the reason for the reason for that being is that Julia's probably not going to, at least by reports I've seen, is not going to leave stardom until April. So I think I think that's when her contract is up. It would be great so, for Nora, like it would, but I think that they'll find someone else for Julia to chop the title to rather than Trisha Dora. Do they have anything like a, an event scheduled between then, or? 
we'll start and have plenty of events and i'm sure new japan will come back to america at some point at that time as well so that fundamentally they'll find a place for junior to drop to drop the title i just don't think it'll be here yeah that's disappointing i might be inclined to agree with you i was hoping that adora would win but i'll say julia Uh, then we have Matt Riddle and a mystery partner yet to be named. He'll be taking on Zack Sabre Jr. and Bad Dude Tito in a tag team match. It's one of my favorite names that's out there. Bad Dude Tito. <laughs> it's so, <laughs> that's so ridiculous sounding. So this is Riddle's first match in New Japan. So the likelihood is that he's going to win. But the interesting thing is who's his partner going to be. And I have absolutely no idea who that could be. Randy, no. Um... <laughs> I don't know anyone that's like that's in my immediate field of vision that feel like who isn't currently wrestling for even New Japan or is outside of it that would be coming in for this one. But it could realistically be um, there's anyone that he's interacted with since he's been in MLW. Barnett on this show? Uh, Jim Barnett could be, yeah. No, not Jim Barnett. I just... No, Josh, Josh, Barnett. Barnett, Josh Barnett, sorry, wrong thing. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it could be someone that's a bit more on the... Um, Team Bloodsport blood or whatever? Sign. Yeah. I don't think it'll be anyone, like... Because at the end of the day, it has to be someone who's willing to... I would say risk their reputation, but to be associated with Riddle. Well, so. I mean, like, it's getting worse in terms of just, like, the risking the reputation. Not that Matt Stryker had a great reputation beforehand, mm. but it's getting worse. What about, uh... uh... Oh my god, what's his name? Um, uh, the guy that was team uh, doing the whole thing with the the fight pit and NXT shit. He was a good wrestler. He had like Timothy the, Thatcher is the Thatcher. Name you're yeah, Thatcher. He, I liked uh, Thatcher. He's cool so with Riddle, right? So Thatcher, uh, well, I don't know, but Thatcher's wrestling in um, in Noah right now. But that doesn't mean that he couldn't come on for a New Japan show. Hmm. Um, oh, what about Suzuki? No, oh, I hope. Okay. Again, I just, I guess he's a guy that's on Teflon. But I'd rather he just beat the shit out of Riddle than like, <laughs> actually wrestle alongside him. And also, he has a he has a history with Zack Sabre Jr., so that would make it. Oh, I don't know. Maybe that'd be a way of. Maybe that'd be a way of like, um, like counteracting anybody that had like a negative reaction to Riddle by having Suzuki come out because everyone loves Suzuki. So, um, yeah, we'll wait and see. I mean, I think that Riddle's going to win anyway, and then he'll probably pin uh, Tito. So. What's Jeff Cobb doing? Uh, he's part of the uh, United Empire, so I think it's unlikely he's going to yeah, be part of Yeah, it's not going to happen. Okay. Yeah. Um, then we have the uh, AEW Continental Crown defense. Uh, so it's going to be uh, Eddie Kingston defending against Gabe Kidd. Uh, yeah, Kingston's going to win. Yeah, he's going to lose his title on the, battle, on the Battle of Valley show. So. But it's quite interesting that this is for the... This has been named for the Continental Crown Championship. It's not being just for the strong title. So I'm it's... begging somebody to clarify. Well, it's giving the indication that this is a this is a triple crown in the sense that all three titles are being defended at all times. So yeah, uh, but yeah, obviously King retaining. Yeah, I mean he might not even be champion going into it because he's defending the title against uh, uh, Will Utah on oh, Rampage. That'd be great. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that didn't happen either. <laughs> that didn't happen. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, but yeah, yeah, that's something uh, we need to talk about when it comes to Tony Khan with numbers. <laughs> mm. uh, we have uh, an ODQ match: Shingo Takagi versus John Moxley. This could go. This could go either way. I mean, the likelihood is the Moxley wins because both the fact that he's in AEW and also he rarely loses in New Japan, even when he wasn't like as closely fixed to AEW. But this should just be a lot of fun. No DQ. Moxley's going to bleed everywhere. Shingo might bleed as well, and. Yeah, but I think this could be in terms of just well outside of the main event. This should be the most fun match, and yeah, I'm gonna go. With Moxley wins. So yeah, I don't think Moxley should be losing. Yeah, Moxley wins. Then the main event is uh, Kazuchika Okada versus Will Ospreay. This isn't Will Ospreay's final New Japan match, but it's be like his final big singles match. And yeah, I think Okada wins. Like he lost to Osprey in the uh, G1. So that was like the big, like Osprey win to um, to help him get like that big 
Ricardo that he's been missing for quite a while. But the first clean win he got, because the only other win he's had over Ricardo uh, by underhanded means. So, yeah, I think Ocado just gets his win back. Osprey's on his way out anyway, so they're just going to go around and have the best match they can with each other one last time. Yeah, I could see uh, Osprey winning here and then getting to do the post-show speech. I think that Ocado will let him do the post or at least let him get involved in that speech anyway. But I think Ocado's, I think Ocado's definitely winning. Should be a great match. I don't know what I'm watching on Saturday because there's five shows, but you're, you're watching all of it at the same time. You're just doing multiple tabs. <laughs> I mean, I'll I'll be watching two of them. I don't know which one's going to be the odd one out. Mm-hmm. Um, then I think it's worth like talking about some of the other like shows that are coming up now that we've talked about Battle of the Valley. So there's a lot of like uh, new beginning shows coming up throughout uh, February. That's it, these are, like the big shows prior to New Japan Cup launching. That will take place in like late February, early March. So, I'll, I'll skip through like all the like nothing happening matches and just talk about the big ones. So, there's going to be a King of Pro Wrestling provisional. Uh, that's this first one is taking place on the uh, January the twentieth, so about a week or so from now. Um, there's going to be uh, Tom and Tong is going to be defending his Never Open Championship against Evil. So, if he is leaving, then it seems pretty obvious that Evil's going to win the title here. They did the whole thing where it was like he was taken off the site or something, right? And then well, it was like uh, revealed that he was that like was evil, evil forced the person to do yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, that's hysterical. By the way. Yeah, I laughed at that. Yeah, there's also going to be a King of Pro Wrestling uh, title provisional uh, match. So the, well, the the title essentially for the King of Pro Wrestling title. So Taiji Shimori is going to be defending against Gray Khan. Um, I'm trying to remember what the stipulations were. I think one of the stipulations that um, O'Connor has put forward is as a ball rope match. So, um, so I presume that would just be your typical bull, bull rope match where it's like you have to touch the corners, or or they're just tied together as a uh, by by a ball rope. Um, I, I, uh, I have to see if I can find what the um, what the other one. Oh yeah, so. Oh, so actually got the name wrong. So he wants a rope death match. So no DQs and all four corners have to be touched in succession to win. So it's that kind of bull rope match. And then Ishimori's one is a is a ten minute Ishimori ring fit match. <laughs> what? Which is okay. So here, so the last title holder after ten minutes wins. So it's basically an Iron Man match, but it's potentially like who scramble. Last pins, yeah, essentially a scramble between two people, and then there's been to be there's going to be thirty second exercise intervals after e- every three minutes. That rules. <laughs> <laughs> essentially, he's basically going to think like he's in really good shape and Grato Khan is, and, and so he's going to try and use the exercise thing in order to tire him out. <laughs> but really, but, but realistically, the bull rope match is going to win. So, so that will probably awesome. be when the match happens. Um, but Ishimori will probably win in, anyway. Um, then we have so a show take place on uh, so then there's like a long tour and then the next big show they have is on the the new beginning in Osaka which is Sunday the Fe- February the 11th. So the big matches on this one are the Never Open Weight Six Man Tag Titles being defended. So that is Okada, Tanahashi, and Ishii defending against Kose Fujita, Shane Haste, and Mikey Nichols of the Mighty Don't Neil. Um. I mean, this is a really great. This has been a great run for the six-man tag team titles. It's the best run they probably had of their entire legacy. Um, and it'd be interesting if they, they lost it here, but I think that they'll probably retain this one. I think they probably they must have like a big team in mind to eventually take them down. And I don't think it'll be like the three kind of lesser members of the My Don't Neil. Um, then they have the IWGP tag title match is going to be is going to happen. So this is for the actual IWGP tag team championships: El Fantasmo and Hikaleo versus Chase Owens and Kenta, which is which is very underwhelming because mm-hmm. Kenta's not Kenta anymore, and Chase Owens has never been a big guy in New Japan. So uh, more important matches: uh, there's going to be it's uh, Zack Sabre Junior versus Brian Danielson too. Hey, that'll be uh, fun. Yeah, so we'll see how that goes and if one will be able to... They've made a promise that that one of them is going to submit the other one. So they haven't said that it's specifically a submission match, but that's essentially what this story is going into it. So 
We'll see how that goes. Um, and then we have, I think there's a good chance uh, Saber Jr. wins that one to get his win back as well. But also close to the time. And then the final match is Will Ospreay's final New Japan match or match as uh, official member of the New Japan roster. It's going to be a five on five steel cage match. Uh, so Will Ospreay and other members of the United Empire, Jeff Cobb, Hanare, TJP and Francesco Akira versus five members of the Bullet Club, David Finley, Alice Coughlin, Gabe Kidd, Clark Connors and Driller Mal- Maloney. That one I think Osprey might win and get to to sign off from with the crowd. Say goodbye to them officially. But uh but yeah, it's quite interesting to see a big steel cage match on a New Japan show. You don't see that too often. Um then the next big show is on Friday, February twenty third. Uh, the big matches there are Hiroshi Tanahashi is going to defend the TV title against Matt Riddle. Which you are still thinking that Matt Riddle's going to win that? I think it's, I don't think it's absolutely certain he's going to win, but I've, I'd be surprised if he didn't. But again, I don't know what his long term future in Japan is like, considering what type of person he is. Because he says, oh yeah, I'm not going to do drugs over in Japan. And until he does drugs over in Japan, and then he's in real trouble. <laughs> If he's in trouble now, then he'd be in real, real trouble. Like, and, and then the main event of that show is the IWGP Global Heavyweight Championship match for David Finley defense against Nick Nemeth. I would think that Finley will retain that, but we'll see how it I goes. I would like for, for Dolph Ziggler to just win belts. I feel like I can say that again. Maybe, and maybe have a little bit of hope, a smidgen <laughs> of hope. Like, he's, it's put up or shut up time, and they put him against Finley. And my fear is that he's just again being used as a guy to get people over. You know? Yeah, well, that's kind of his lot in life now, I guess. Yeah, but he can do more, and I want to see it. Let's see him do more. And then the final big show before um, the New Japan Cup is New Beginning in Sapporo on the uh, Saturday, the 24th of February, so the day afterwards. Uh, Nick Nemeth, funnily enough, is having a tag team match in that one. It's going to be him and Taguchi versus Gedo and uh, David Finlay. So that's that's usually quite common where they've had a match and then they just have a tag team match afterwards as well. So we'll see whoever which one of them's the champion anyway. Uh, but then the whole story of this show is it's basically um, Lij versus just five guys in five si- in five singles matches. So it's Bushi versus Takamichinoku. They're kind of like the the uh, junior guys. And then another junior match, uh, Hiromi Takahashi versus D- uh, Duki. Uh, then we have Yotosuji versus Yuya Umura in a rematch from Wrestle Kingdom. So Suji will probably win that to tie them up at one and one. Uh, then Shingo Takagi versus Taichi, which should be great because their matches are always great with each other. And then the main event, Naito defends the uh, IWGQ World Championship again against Sonata. So, yeah, doing a rematch of the Wrestle Kingdom main event. Um, do you, yeah. you think Sonata just wins? I hope not, but like this company has a uh, at least for the world title picture in the last like year or so, it does have a uh, tendency to, dis- to disappoint me. So I wouldn't be surprised <laughs> I if Sonata. Say, like, I haven't vibed with New Japan since they put the title on Evil. It, it's, I don't know. It's, it's they've had a, like a, a rough time getting back going after the pandemic. Um. But yeah, I think that I, I think that Naito will retain. They must have someone else in mind for him to to lose to, but uh, or for him to him to lose the title to. So yeah, I hope that they just don't revert back to Sonata here. But yeah, that's basically all the big things to transfer. So basically, between now and the end of February, there's a lot of big shows lined up. A lot of they've basically set up all their match, all their big matches now. So just see how they all come together. Mm. So those are the outside of WWE and AEW topics. I think that I've got down for everything. Let me just double check that we don't have anything else. Uh, nope. Everything else I got in those two companies. Let's bounce over to the WWE stuff here with um, some tag team names. <laughs> uh, Bobby Lashley and the Street Profits are going to be called the pride. There's worst tag team names out there. It's not my favorite. How do you guys feel? 
Uh, Savinia. Yeah, it's the first thing I thought of. <laughs> exactly the first thing I thought of. Uh, no, it's good. Good. They're the pride. And as you can see by Bobby Lashley's uh, Twitter bio, it's he said that and then put up the uh, fist emoji. So it's a kind of a take on like the Black Pride thing. I, I dig it. They need they to add uh, Joy Giovanni to the team so they can be Pride and Joy. <laughs> Instead, they have VFab, who now has red hair. Really? Is she, uh, that, like, they're still going to try to do something? I, I don't know what they're doing with Ashanti the Adonis, for that matter. So, okay, so that was a digital exclusive. I understand you not knowing. Um, no, VFab checked on them after they got beat up by Karrion Cross, and she's uh, like, what are we going to do now? It's like we. <laughs> what do you mean we? Um, I guess maybe they'll end up putting her in the group as they've uh, teased for a little bit. But somebody yeah. has to beat up Scarlet. I mean, it could be plenty other people. Beefab's no, not mean. my not my good option for that. <laughs> don't tell me you don't want to see Beefab versus Scarlet. I don't want to see Beefab versus Scarlet. <laughs> yeah, the pride. You know, it could work. It could grow on me. I'll, I'll put it that way. Um, it's not the worst name I've ever heard. It's not the Twinkle Twins. Because that's Katana Chance and Caden Carter, apparently. Excuse the, me? The Twinkle Twins. Who said that? That was apparently not only Chelsea Green on Twitter, but Michael Cole bringing that up. Fuck off. No, it's not. No. no. The Twinkle Twins. Absolutely not. Zero. If they have gone from... Team Ninja, which was an awful name, to the life of the party, which they never officially crowned them, but it's like, that's fine. Even though I still think that the gimmick doesn't fit them at all. If they are legitimately going to go by the Twinkle Twins, <laughs> that is so bad. <laughs> that's, a, you know, we talked about the TNA logo thing looking like it's a font from some Nickelodeon show. Twinkle Twins sounds like it's a Nickelodeon show. Be like, you know, Right after Rugrats, the Twinkle Twins comes on, and it's about like two little, I don't know, two little girl witches or something. <laughs> like, awful, awful name. They're not the Twinkle Twins. Stop it. <laughs> You're not going to take a derogatory term from Chelsea Green and make that your team name. I don't mean derogatory <laughs> and like it's offensive. I just mean like said in a derogatory tone. You're not going to take that and be like, hey, that's what they are now. No, you're not. No. Uh, I don't know. I wouldn't put it past them. Life of the party is fine. Like, it is fine. I don't care if their promos are wooden. It's fine. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, it's... I mean, the most irritating thing I think about that is they're not not twins. Yeah, not in the slightest bit. They only have KC and KC names are the only things that have a connection. Now Sparkle Sisters, now you're talking. Yeah. <laughs> That's uh I don't know about that. Uh and the other one being AOP, Karen Cross, uh Scarlet, and Paul Ellering seemingly being called Final Testament. I like it. Fuck it. I'm all in. Last chance for them, but like I'm all in on well, this. Final it's, chance. <laughs> it's it's silly. It's everything I would do. It's a stupid faction that looks like it would fit perfectly in the Hogan era or the New Gen era or any other era. I, I'm here for it. Especially because you got Paul Ellering with AOP, which should have always been the case. Yeah, I mean, it's got Karen Cross in it, so I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> so we might get some confirmation about that tonight. Might be like uh, on SmackDown yeah, that they say that. some kind of promo where it's like, we are the final testament, TikTok, whatever the, you know, fuck that else they want to say. Um, let's all talk about some other tag team things, though. The Dusty Rhodes Tag Team Classic has officially begun. We have the bracket now. We know two of the teams that have moved on already. Which is weird that they like they had to wait until basically after those two teams did that for them to even set the full bracket. But Baron Corbin and Braun Breaker beat Gallus and seemingly are growing it out right now. So they are even more so 
basically confirmed to be the finals. They were already going to be the favorites to be in the finals because they're two of the big names and they like doing these singles pairs, get into the finals things of the Dusty Road Tag Team Classic. If not, just flat out win. But they got along pretty well and they are uh, going to be going up against Axiom and Nathan Fraser who beat Hank and Tank. Still was kind of surprised about the layout of this because I would have thought they would have done something different. But we know that the other side of the bracket is Chase University's uh, going up against the LWO. Now, the LWO, I don't know why they're back in here again. Because Cruz Del Toro and Joaquin Wild have been on the main roster for many, many months. And I'm assuming part of it is that they just think, well, you know, if we put a main roster team on there, maybe we'll get some more views and stuff, even though it's Crystal Toro and Joaquin Wild. So it's not like it's like bringing in, uh, I don't know, Judgment Day or something. Um, but Wikipedia right now has this listed as Andre Chase and Riley Osborne rather than Duke Hudson and Riley Osborne. Did I miss something there? Did they switch that again? No. I thought it was just like specifically Duke Hudson and Riley Osborne. It's specifically Duke Hudson and Riley Osborne. So somebody must have edited that the wrong way or whatever. But I'm anticipating Chase University wins. And Hang on, I'm going on the website now because I'm unsure. Maybe it's a uh, maybe it's a Wikipedia error because Wikipedia, of course, people fuck it around. It definitely that. says on W.com Riley Osborne and Duke Hudson. Yeah, so somebody's flat out wrong there. Um, Ichizanofe and Malik Blade are going up against Trick and Mello. So we're back to the same thing that we've had before. Where we've talked about how Trick and Mello either win this or they fail to win it or something. But the finals are taking place at Vengeance Day. And with Ilya Dragunov being out, for however long at a you know determinate amount of time for his injuries i think that this is exactly the like distraction that they basically need to do in the meantime because they can't seemingly do the dragon off match and i think we're getting a triple threat at stand and deliver so if this is the means to kill some time and Vengeance Day comes around February 4th. Trick and Mellow up against Corbin and Breaker. Either Trick and Mellow win, and then you've got the rest of February to kind of go through, and the rest of March, I guess, to a certain extent. Uh, February, March to get through Trick and Mellow having a tag title shot, failing. They turn on each other. They're both set up for the triple threat. Whoever wins at Stand and Deliver wins, and, you know, it's not going to be Dragon Off. Dragon Off's dropping that belt. So. I'm expecting that to be the case, but maybe Corbin and Breaker win. And this is the whole setup is to have the split with Trick and Mello at Vengeance Day. Um, I really like Corbin and Breaker's match. I just want to put that out there because they're, they're very fun together. They work pretty uh, well together, right? Yeah. Yeah, I thought it was a fun match. Ron Breaker is a lot of fun to watch when he's just, he's the closest thing to Goldberg we have. He's just got to be explosive all the time. But yeah, I don't know why we're doing this Trick and Mellow thing. At this point, I'm convinced that despite the reports saying that, oh, it's an angle, it's an angle, kind of thinking Ilya might be out of action for a decent enough reason that they were just like, Hey, we're not even going to show him at mm-hmm. New Year's Evil. He's just not cleared to compete. You know, it wasn't like, oh, he's cleared and he's going to fight through. They just didn't even show him. So I'm thinking he's either hurt or he's sidelined for another reason. But I don't know where they're going here. I don't want to see Chicken Mello win or, or get to the finals even. It depends, I think, on when they want to do the fallout because if Corbin and breaker are fighting the D'Angelo family at stand and deliver, then that makes sense. If they want to do the tag title match on like an episode of NXT in the meantime, then I think trick and mellow win. And then they just do that whole story. I don't know. I'm waiting for the main roster to be like, yeah, we need 
Corbin because we need somebody to get beat up. <laughs> Someone. Um, let's see what else happened on this NXT episode that we can talk about. Uh, that typical thing with Fallon Henley's ranch, Tiffany Stratton just like slipping on poop and falling into water and being all like, ew, it was it's gross. Fun. It's exactly what we were anticipating, except just some random extras that were out there to be like laughing and stuff. And I don't know why those people were doing that, but I was surprised a little bit about Blair Davenport beating the key to lions to start that off. Figured yeah, lions would win that. that. So clean too. Uh, Lyra Valkyria setting up another thing again with like, they're really harping on Lola Vice and Electra Lopez. And then they got Tatum Paxley helping her out. There's going to be a battle royal next week where the when it comes down to the final four people, it's going to turn into a fatal four way, and the winner is going to fight Valkyria at Vengeance Day. Now, Lopez is my main pick right now. I think that they're going to do Lopez wins the battle royal. Lola Vice uses her breakout tournament cash in, and we have like a triple threat and or a fatal four-way with Tatum Paxley involved. What's your pick? I don't like when people who can do what was done on the Tuesday show, which is successfully cash in a contract, choose to make it more difficult for themselves. So I hope that's not what we see. I was just thinking Cora is going to win and Cora is going to win the belt. But I, I, I can see where you're thinking. I think the final four could end up being Kiana, Roxanne, Aura, and Electra. But I definitely think there's a good shot that Cora just wins this. I think Cora is Davenport quick. I think Cora is doing the stand and deliver match. I think there's going to be a ladder match. Could be, maybe, yeah. Throw a bunch of people in there, like Roxanne and all. One person that's not going to be in there is Eva, though. Uh, <laughs> Luca Crucifino is trying to protest his loss. Eva, you know, she's doing her thing, whatever. Now they're <laughs> they're booting her as soon as the Rock's done with his match at Mania. It's happening. They're keeping her just long enough for that I match to happen. I don't think that's what's happening, but uh, we'll uh, see. That set up, though, a North American title match. Dragon Lee retained over Lexus King. And then immediately afterward, Oba Femi cashed in his breakout tournament match and won the North American title, which means that he is the first next in line athlete to actually win a championship in WWE. And he's also, I think, the youngest champion now at this point. He's 22. Yep. Good for Oba Femi. Go back and listen to me <laughs> rant and rave about how great this kid is and the fact that he's only 22. I am shocked that they strapped him up this quick. I'm super happy because there's something there. And this is really cool. And Callum, I get like a million fantasy league points, right? Like... <laughs> That's a, I mean, if you'd ever had the foresight of adding into your team, then maybe. I mean, this, <laughs> I think I did when I made the case. <laughs> like, yeah, this, one, this was fantastic. Like, fucking Lexus King ain't doing jack shit, though. That's, that's the point. But, man, oh, about me. It's awesome. <laughs> Brindley Reese is going to be doing some like workout tips character now. Oh, yeah, she's doing the Simon system. I think that's it. Yeah, um, I'm not super high on that. Jada Parker is going to be joining OTM. That's a great pairing. Makes sense. Uh, and JT Jane got spied on with NXT Anonymous. She's got like a plan for Chase U, but you know, there's nothing really going on there. Um, Josh Briggs still going after that North American, uh, not the North American, the uh, NXT Heritage Cup. I think he might end up winning that at Santa Deliver, so depending on how long they want to drag that out. Nope, Nothing happening. He's gonna say, Briggs, I need you in my corner, and then or Jensen, I need you in my corner, and then it's gonna be, oh, he turned on him. I'm so shocked. <laughs> Maybe that's what it is, yeah. Nothing on Raw. I think that we need to go back and talk about really um Ivar's finisher is called the Doom Salt. That's pretty cool. That's Love a great name for a move. 
Ludwig Kaiser did like an injury thing with Kofi, which may or may not set up something for the Royal Rumble. I, I know a lot of people are hoping that that means that Big E is coming back, which I don't know if there's like a direct connection between any of that, but I'm no, I just hope he's coming back. Yeah. I, just, I hope that that's the case just because I hope he's healthy enough to do it. And uh, we need to talk about our truth. We're not kidding. We're not not talking about Raw and not talking about that great our truth video package and the fact that Truth is currently outselling CM Punk in merchandise because as people he, are just loving this Judgment Day thing. As he should. Our Truth is a, a national treasure. <laughs> Big fan of the Our Truth stuff, though. Um, and then uh, you know we had this big hoopla over Jinder Mahal that we gotta <laughs> talk about um this will transition us into the remaining AEW topics and stuff if you didn't know Jinder Mahal is getting a title match next week and that might upset you for if you're the type of person who's like ah oh, Jinder Mahal doesn't deserve this like he's you know he shouldn't have been WWE champion to begin with and all but I guess the one person who's the most upset about this in the world is Tony Khan of all people who <laughs> took to Twitter to be like I understand what he's going for here, but it is embarrassing the way that this came off where he's just like, welcome. Everybody's complaining about hook. And then nobody's complaining about general Mahal. hook had these amount of uh, wins and general Mahal didn't. And over this time frame of these many months, whatever, look, not everybody cares about win loss records over a certain spreadsheet time and all that. And most people are laughing about this gender Mahal thing. They're not legitimately just like, oh, he deserves a title match. They're like, this is stupid, but LOL. And Tony's upset about this. And that created a whole big thing with Jinder Mahal then tweeting out, who the fuck is Hook? (laughs) And then Bischoff tweeting a a clown emoji to Tony Khan, who thought that he was really like hitting him with like a a real one two punch with like, um, what was it like, shut up, you miserable hack or something? I think it was the gift. Get out of the hack or something. Which then uh, Eric Bischoff, I think, completely shut him down with the uh, screenshot of <laughs> when he was on AEW and it, he's labeled as a groundbreaking <laughs> person in history. And he's like a, a groundbreaking miserable. Heck. <laughs> this whole thing's embarrassing, I think. And oh. I know that some people are going to try to justify it by saying like, well, it gets him engagement. So he gets to promote the thing more and all. And he's just trolling and all that other kind of but you know what i think that that's the same mentality that people have when you know how like there's that that type of guy that like hits on a girl she rejects him then he's like oh i don't care you're ugly anyway i think that that's like reversal of like i'm not actually upset i did it for this reason i'm just trolling lol i think that tony Khan needs to be not worried about the general hall thing because nobody thinks hook's gonna beat samoa joe and nobody thinks that general hall is gonna win the wwe championship outright like if anything, Damian Priest cashed in, but I don't think that that's even got remotely, you know, a remote chance to begin with anyway. It's like the Jenna Mahal thing's funny. Let me take it seriously. Well, here's what I'm worried about I'm worried that the stupid engagement, because a lot of people got in on this. Coachman tweeted, I, mean, like, I could have been WWE champion if Vince wanted because it's not real. Mm-hmm. Wins and losses don't matter. I'm worried that this is all going to leave this and the fact that he did the thing with the rock and the rock in an Instagram video was like, yeah, Jim Hall, he's built like a stud. He's great. I'm like, Oh, are we really going to get gender mania season again? Like we did in 2018 where for some reason he ends up beating Bobby Roode, Randy Orton. And, uh, was it, was it Jeff Hardy or Rusev? One of those two, for the U S title. It's like, I don't want that to happen. And I definitely don't want him beating Seth. Because I think one way or another, Seth is losing. So he can win it back at the Royal Rumble. Just so he can have something to do. I think it's as outright as just he beats Jinder and that's it. (laughs) Like, I don't think that there's anything to this. I think something's happening. I think they missed the boat on Priest cashing in at day one. Because I, I think if you wait any longer, it's like people aren't going to care about Priest. And they're definitely not going to be like, oh, let's see the Damien Priest CM Punk feud. 
if Punk does end up winning the world title. But as far as the Tony Khan stuff, I retweeted someone who said, USA's original tweet about Cage Match was funny. Tony mm-hmm. Khan's tweet was funny. Jinder's tweet was funny. This is all funny. Don't take it so seriously. That's, like, that's, that's it. You know, he was trying to have some fun dunking on USA because they're like, yeah, okay, you want to mock Cage Match ratings, that's fine. But Jinder hasn't done anything. And now he's suddenly in a world title match. And people take it way too fucking seriously. Like, shut up. So it's all fun. Who cares? Yeah, I mean, yeah, my, my, my general thing is just like, it's just a lot of people making many kind of like lighthearted comments, just like picking holes, which are obvious holes. I mean, I have seen people that have commented about like they did that promo of Hook challenging Samoa Joe, and this everyone just go, "Oh, what the fuck? Why the fuck's Hook being the guy that's challenging Samoa Joe? What's Hook ever done to earn a world title match? This is fucking stupid." And then when Jinder gets so we're just like, eh, "Cool, Jinder's gonna fight for the world title. Fine, that's and, and so yeah, I can kind of understand Tony Khan's rationale is like because it is an unbalanced approach to it, and. I've one of the people that feels that he's justified in saying that to be AEW is to be constantly under attack because there are just a load of people out there that just hate the company for the mere fact that they exist in a world where WWE exists and why isn't WWE just the only wrestling company in the world and those sort of people. So I think that Khan's response was measured and accurate. I did see a lot of, and then, and then, and then everyone, yeah, and then everyone jumped on. Fundamentally, WWE should be thanking Tony Khan for all that stuff because now people actually care about this Jinder Mahal for Seth Rollins. Yeah, that's what I'm worried about. Uh, I don't think there's any bit on WWE that thinks that this is a bad thing. I think that in their mind, they're like, "Wow, it's giving a lot more attention to the gender thing," and that they think as well that Tony Khan looks like kind of the petulant Tony little Khan kid, like, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah like- no. No, I, I fundamentally, like the people that look like petulant little kids are all the people that then responded to Tony Khan's tweet, say, "Hey, the gender run wasn't that bad. Hey, gender's great. Stop hindering gender and all those that." Those people are just shit. stupid. <laughs> yeah, no, that's yeah. what I was gonna say. I saw way too many people being like, <laughs> "Look at gender's first entrance as champion. Wasn't this so great?" No. Yeah, those. That's just you know, it's ridiculous. I mean, it's all the history, and and yeah, you could say like, Khan is is like the comments like he doesn't necessarily need to try and stoke any of those fires or anything like that he just like let things go on but fundamentally he's just like he's just trying to promote his own guys and to try and also talk about the fact to like that there is a double standard in wrestling fan base and again i know it's that whole tribalism thing of the wwe fans say this aw fans say this bloody bloody blah, blah, blah and don't really want to get re- involved into too much like twitter discourse but Again, you always go back in history and say, like, oh, uh, it's the people that say things like this. Oh, Vincent Mann would never say anything like clownish like this. Like, fucking hell, he had, like, um, uh, was it the Nacho Man and yeah. all this other stuff back in, like, on primetime television. Doing all that, that stuff point. is, like, it's so embarrassing anytime yeah, anybody yeah, does it's, anything it's like petty. that. Yeah, it's, it's all petty. I say, I'm not, like, justifying Tony Khan's feet. He probably should just, like, I would say, like, stick to just doing stuff but i think that like as a guy who thinks that twitter or x is like a big platform for engagement opportunity and chance to like get his point across and try and pick up his own side of things i totally understand what well, i understand i said like I-, I know why he did it you can, j- you can obviously argue one way or the other whether it's like a good thing to do or not i mean, fu- I mean fundamentally it's like a no harm no foul thing we'll f- have forgotten about this in like a week's time anyway and then Jinder will have his match. It'll be a, a bigger deal now. Like Seth Rollins will try and carry Jinder Mahal to the first three star match of his entire career, and then we'll, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. And then Seth Rollins will talk about how great he is at wrestling as well because he managed to get a great a, a twenty minute match out of Jinder Mahal. Like so, I'll say this about Jinder. Seriously, Jinder, he's in that Miz Kofi camp that I keep talking about lately, where it's like you have. Jinder looks great. There's zero doubt. You can't say otherwise. He looks great. He looks like a guy who would have been a big deal at one point in time based on his physique alone. But he had a mid-run with the championship. And then they immediately dropped him down the card. I hate when they do this thing where they're... Just because you can say, 
Jinder was a former WWE champion. Now he's feuding like with Teflon Seth. or something. Yeah. It's like, I hate that because that actively, it doesn't help Jinder. It hurts championships. You know what I mean? And, and just on a personal, like this whole thing where if you take it too seriously, like Tony, you're, oh, you're such a fucking nerd. Tony Khan, you not me. <laughs> yeah, obviously. And then if you take it, you know, if you're like coach who says, yeah, idiot wins and losses shouldn't matter because it's fake. Now, now you're not respecting wrestling enough. Can we all just like fucking chill and just like, yeah. none of this matters. Wait. I think it's more on the ideas of, like, you have to pick a line and stick to it. Like, these people that, or certain people that will question why certain people are feuding with each other. And then, like, the Jinder Mahal thing happens, and says, oh, it's just, it's funny, just, like, Jinder's just, why are they putting Jinder in a time match? Okay, lol, all that stuff. It's like, well, then you can't, if you take that position, you're more than welcome to take that position, but then you can't care about who is fighting for the title WrestleMania, or you can't care for who's fighting for the title in other things, because fundamentally it's just wrestling. Who cares, bro? They can just fight. Anyone can fight anyone. Who cares? That's why I don't like that mindset. And I want to shout yeah, out... you should take it seriously. We as we as actual wrestling fans take things seriously, and yeah, it can be a case of like you can go a bit too overboard. Like you shouldn't care about every single like minute detail that's happening, every single match, every single thing about it. But if you're going to care about something, you might as well care like a better deal about it. It's not. It's like I don't know. I'm trying to think of like like a mob fan base if they decided to um, I don't know kill off like one of the big characters during one of the Avengers movies for whatever reason it's like just go like yeah they can do that or I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think of like a good example like what is there anything you, you guys well, know about okay, is there anything, like, anything um, that's in like the Marvel franchise which was like a really like seemed like an odd decision or an odd move to take <laughs> everything anyway. pretty much yeah. everything since then game <laughs> yeah probably but yeah so it's just a case it's, of but it's like um like uh, the Harley Quinn animated series where the whole thing is basically just, you know, all these comic book nerds take Batman too seriously. And sometimes it's like, yeah, I get it, and it's funny, but at the, at the same time, you don't need to strip away everything that makes Batman Batman just because you're trying to prove a point. I look at it this way. A match that's for the title on an episode of TV doesn't inherently need to have the same value as a pay-per-view and yeah. a B-level pay-per-view doesn't need to have the same value as Mania. So when they, it's like Hook against Samoa Joe, it's like, all right, well, Hook's not winning that. And I don't think anybody in their right mind, I should say, because there's certainly people that are like, there's those Stan accounts and all those things where people are, you know, they, they think that like, it's Izzy Dame's time. She's going to be world champion and headlining Mania by next year. And it's like, fucking relax. Come on. I, I know you like these people, but Jesus Christ, calm down. Like, Hook's not beating Joe. Joe has, like, something to do in the meantime. And it's fine. Like, it's it's the same to me as, like, it's fine that Jinder Mahal is fighting Seth Rollins because it's not a real match. Like, it's not. He's not getting a title match in a sense to be like you should take this seriously yeah. wwe knows that everybody thinks this way about jinder mahal they're not oh, treating this as like if they counter argument though but if like, they would have booked him as like the opponent at like SummerSlam, then it would be like what the fuck are they doing but it's like it's a, a random episode of raw on the way to royal rumble for them to have rollins just beat a dude it's the same as if they would give the an intercontinental title match from Gunther's defending against Otis. You know, like I, I mean, I I do understand that to a degree, but I also kind of also ask the question: Why shouldn't it matter? But if it doesn't matter, and if it does matter, then you have to apply that to other things, and then that's where I get if that like if everything's supposed to really matter and you're supposed to say gender needs to have had all these matches to build up to him and you have to be treated like that, then well, I, I'd say beyond the point of like, like I, I, I assume that like, I, I, it doesn't need to be like, Oh, he has to go on like a 15 match winning streak, but it's been more around the case of you probably should do more than be absolutely punked out and beaten the shit out by the rock the previous week. And then just having a promo with Seth Rollins and Seth Rollins. Okay. We'll fight for the title. And that's kind of it. Because yeah, I think like, I think that he's just gonna beat him quick. Like it's just not gonna no, I think like it's just a joke. 
Now this is no. this is Seth. This is Seth Rollins you're talking about. Seth is going to try and drag a twenty minute match out of him. It's going to be it's going to be a full match, Tony. Because because that's what Seth's mindset is. Seth thinks that he's the best wrestler in the world. Uh, he's demonstrably wrong, but he thinks he's the best wrestler in the world, and so he he's going to try and have the best match of Jinder's career. But then I think if you apply that same, like it has to have, you have to build up gender more for it to matter and all, then I think that that completely irrelegates all of those pay-per-views that we get from Tony Khan and elsewhere, where it's like, don't you just want to see these two people fight each other? Because then I go like, I don't know these ROH people. Uh, why should I care? They've had two wins on a Ring of Honor episode, and now they're they're fighting for the ROH world title on an AEW episode. Like, no, nah, I don't give a shit. They're nobodies. Yeah, but what but they I'm have, but they is, have, but they have been built up. Just you haven't seen it. No, no. I mean, like, if they just bring somebody in there and they haven't necessarily done anything, where they just go like, "Well, but they're supposed to be on the indies, and you're supposed to care." Well, I'm not watching the indies, and in your company, it's the same. Like if you come in on one show and you just get told that information, then you have to apply that logic and say, well, at least he's a former world champion. Yeah, I just think that everybody's everybody's treating it like the gender thing is way more serious than it actually is. I think, so and that's where Tony I Khan gets all upset. It. And then I'm like, hey, relax, man. Like, if I Aaron Solo uh, was going up against somebody for the title, I wouldn't be like, well, he's a multi-year veteran in AEW. I'd be like, that's dumb. The same as how... Uh, yeah, but you know. I would never do that. <laughs> I, I, I say I can understand, like, both sides. I can understand the idea of, like, this, like, not being, like, you should just, like, like play out. It's like, let them do, make their own stupid decisions. You don't have to comment on it. That's totally fair. But I also feel like, you know, put a bit of fucking effort in. And you might make the argument, like, Tony, I've never actually really looked at most of the matches or cars that Tony put together for, like, he's not put effort into it or thought into it. Yeah, he might put a guy from, like, the independent circuit, but at least that guy on the independent circuit is, or guy or girl on the independent circuit is, like, doing stuff on the independent circuit. He doesn't just pick out randos that have done nothing for, <laughs> forever on there. So, well, like, for instance, Darby Allen and Sting going up against the Workhorsemen on Collision. This is one of Sting's final matches, and the Workhorsemen are supposed to be built fine. up enough. That was, that was a fucking squash match. That, that was fine. That's what I mean. Like, if it's a squash match, if we end up getting ba what's basically like a comedic thing with gender, then that's, isn't it? But that's, that's, yeah, that's the for problem. the World Championship. And He's that's the problem for the we're World Championship. That. We're not getting Seth punks out gender. It's going to be yeah. if this was gender just like, has a match. Yeah. Yeah, if this was just Seth Rollins versus Jinder Mahal and Seth wasn't the world champion and it was just a match on Raw, then yeah, fine. It doesn't have to, doesn't need to have any story or anything associated with it. This is he's fighting for the world championship. The world championship you're supposed to, what people are supposed to consider is a big deal, and just a random guy who's been out of action for ages was world champion, yes, but like six years ago, and he's done absolutely jack shit since. So then doesn't it mean something more when you have your world champion MJF going up against the righteous for the ROH tag titles and you're like, well, the world champion should be doing more than this. It's not for the title, but at the same time, it's like you're downgrading the world champion by having him go up against these people that aren't worth being the ROH world tag team champions. And it's like, OK, they're in the same ring as him. Like, well, they've been they've been winning matches on Ring of Honor and also like he beat both of them so i think that's pretty good uh like vindication of your world champion by him beating two guys in on his own in a match i say right. i didn't like and, I, and also i i think if you'll remember cool i said that was stupid now so, I, yeah. I agree if like if jinder mahal wins this championship it's absolutely fucking ridiculous and then we start backtracking and being like oh, okay what's happening here but i just i, I think that it's a gag and like that's so like well, that's my problem. The hook and Samoa, I think it's a gag. Yeah, the hook and Samoa Joe thing's a legit thing, and I think that the Jinder Mahal thing's like LOL. But that's like that's kind of where I'm at, where I don't want to see them book legitimately with the mindset of, well, you know the real, but you know what's really going on. You know none of this matters until WrestleMania, and they give you Rock and Roman at Mania, and you go, well, you know Cody will get it eventually. It's like. I just want that mindset to stop. I think a lot of the problem, especially with the WWE fan base right now, is there's too much self-aware. There's too much like, oh, well, we know. 
what we know. It's just like, don't treat everybody like that and actually put a little bit of effort into it instead of going, well, but Ginger's hot right now because you did the thing with The Rock. Yeah, The Rock made him look like a bitch. You know, it's like, I, that's not the message I would want being sent. That's my take on it. I don't, like, I saw Ibu from WrestlePurist tweet this out. He's like, I want this to be the year that we stop doing the whole don't hinder gender. We stop doing the whole, uh, what do you say, Dan Housen's funny. Like, yeah, like I want this to be the, the year yeah. of, like, stop doing that. I'd be down for a lot of that stuff going away. Like, I, I yep. would love for that to go away. Listen, that, there's like faults on multiple sides on this one. At the end of the day, we all kind of, I think we could all probably agree with the the idea that we're done with. We, we, we want like things to be, like things to matter. Yeah. On TV, Absolutely. on pay per view, everything like that as well. These sort of things make it feel like it doesn't matter. The hook thing I can kind of understand because, as I say, you know that he's going to lose the match. But at least with him, he's only lost one singles match. You can understand him like fighting for a world title. And it's just like, it's an interesting match because he's never he's never had a match with Samoa Joe as well so there's something to that and you could tell a really interesting story with the Jinder and Seth thing I saw a funny parody video that someone put out you know that when everyone has these um these monster videos based on the Daniel Bryan yeah uh, <laughs> WrestleMania video. they did one for Jinder based around the fact that, like he's a uh, like he's a uh, uh, fought Seth Rollins before and they were the finals of the uh the NXT title NXT, the NXT title match yeah and I think they they tried to convey it in that one promo segment, but I think you need, you could have done more with it and made it, you know, somewhat worthwhile as a match. Or, you know, do you saying that um, AWK doesn't, I think WWE have done as well, make it a, um, a contender's match instead. Or a, um, like, essentially, like, just it's Seth versus Jinder. If Jinder beats Seth, he gets a world title match. And then you're totally fine. I just think that it's it's having this kind of match devalues the world title because it just feels like anybody, anybody just walks up to Seth can get a shot, and that's right. that's, and that's you, fine. That's fine for like certain titles. Like I say, like a lot of AEW titles are kind of like that, and they like the international and the uh, TNT titles feel a bit like that occasionally. But, um, but yeah, you shouldn't be doing that with your world championship, really. Especially when you want to pretend like this is the belt that's on par with Roman's belt. Like that's my whole issue with it is. Don't do it because you think it's a ha ha and you're just trying to well Dolph Ziggler's not here, so who can we who can we say as a former champion that we can give the spot to? Like go ahead. I was gonna say, can we get uh, I didn't want to like the coffee point, but I wanted to get to like the real crux of this matter as well, because I know we've talked about this probably longer than we need to, but um get the real crux of this, I think she mentioned not beforehand like the things like let's let's move away from the hinge into things and the damn house is funny. Can also twenty twenty four be the year where we stopped caring about what Eric Bishop has to say about anything? If he's got a good enough response like he did for that, I'm I'm down for hearing some of it. But everybody so, uh, for the most part, like I don't care for like yeah, you know, if Dutch Mantel has to like chime in about the current events, I'm like I don't, I don't care. And you know, like, that's why I don't listen to any of these podcasts. I listen to uh, something to wrestle with because I find it more like fun to listen to. But even then, you know, I take a lot of that stuff with a grain of salt because, you know, he's not going to badmouth something that's like going on right now. Or like, you know, I, I find it more interesting to hear the stories of like one man gangs obsessed with fried bologna. But I, everybody's got a fucking podcast and, yeah. Well, like, and I'm in a, I'm Mark, in a weird, I'm the only one you should listen to. <laughs> I'm in a weird bit of a, a spot there where I can say, like, yeah, I get I get Callum's point, but I also am the one writing these articles, and people do gravitate towards it. It's crazy, and, right? Oh yeah, I'm, but, not, I'm, well, not, I'm not. I'm not saying that you you shouldn't be doing it because of course people do gravitate. I'm just I'm just asking those people why do you gravitate? Oh no, it? I like, I understand, and I wish but, we were living in a world where you dictated the. The, the pace, the mindset, but you know, I, I guess that they're just, it's constantly going for the next click, because honestly, this we ran an article earlier, like Bailey's talking about Jinder Mahal, and it's like, are we really doing this? That's, that's <laughs> why it's my biggest fear going into Mania right now, is like, are we really going to end up finding a top spot for Jinder because of a tweet from Tony Khan? 
I'm sure I'm sure Tony Khan would actually be quite happy about that because it's just case like oh one of these matches on the WrestleMania is going to be a big match featuring Jinder Mahal. It's like yeah, go ahead do it. I mean that was like one of his big. I thought that was the the, the better tweet he put out was the idea of uh, um like saying like oh oh no they're going to do more matches with Jinder Mahal in the title match they should do it more often. It's like yeah mm-hmm. of course he wants them to do it because that's shit and it's and everyone knows that it's going to be like a nothing match that no one really like people are going to like ironically. It's one of those, ironically, I like this match because, you know, it's cool to like Jinder Mahal because, no, like, because only, uh, because normal people don't like Jinder Mahal, but it's cool to like Jinder Mahal. That kind of, you know, that weird mentality that like teenagers have. Which, by the yeah. way, for anybody that's putting it out there as like they think that this is going to be the big start, it's not, Jinder's not doing anything at Mania. He's going to be in that battle royal that's going to be on the Friday Night Smackdown prior I to Mania or something. Dumber things happen, Tony, is all I'm saying. He better not. Uh, but then again, I'm you know I wouldn't be booking. I'm, or, I'm already half the shit that they book. <laughs> I'm already writing down that Jinder Mahal versus LA Knight match at uh, like, <laughs> oh, Night One of WrestleMania. Uh, like like we have seen that happen where it's like like Ryback versus Kalisto. Well, not so much that because I was just pretty well, sure. I was thinking but... more like Kofi Mania about the idea of like someone just getting hot in the build up to WrestleMania. Yeah, this is like, it's a bizarro Kofi Mania, but Kofi Mania is a great example, you know, where it's like, or like Ms. Dow. Ms. Dow became a, you know what I mean? Like, stuff like that. It happens. But yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see. I mean, it's at least made the, the match itself a bit more, like, it'll be, have more people talking about it than, the other way, than it really had any right to do so <laughs> beforehand. So... So at least it's gotten, it's, it might get a few more eyeballs or at least a few more talking people talking about Raw than beforehand. So I guess in the grand scheme of things, uh, Tony Khan is a sleeper agent working for Monday Night Raw. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, well, I want to talk about the important news. Hook has a bad signal. I, th- I think that's tremendous. I don't know who decided this, but Hook, when he confronted Samoa Joe, was given his own bat signal. And that's my new favorite thing. <laughs> I do like the hook signal, yeah. Yeah, it's like, it's just, oh, fuck. Like, send it's hook and uh, yeah, call him Batman. Hook, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Makes sense. Well, on the AEW side of things, uh, the main talking points that I had with this week, this week felt like, to me, like uh, just a placeholder show that, like, a lot of the matches, like, you know, Monday Night Raw was just, like, matches, and then a few segments here and there, and, you know, Paige and Castagnoli had a good match, and whatever, but, like, Anna J, Chris Statlander, Thunder Rosa, and Willow Nightingale in a four uh four on four match. And that's basically to set up Anna J going up against Julia Hart at the Battle of the Belts nine show that's happening this Saturday at the same time as everything else. Uh or no, it's happening after collision, right? Yeah. yeah it's yeah. happening after collision. Um Julia Hart's gonna beat Anna J, I'm assuming. But what do you guys have for that? Oh yeah, Julie Hart will retain it. But at least I, I appreciate that they gave um uh, Anna Jay win. I also, um, she's I mean, a big I, prominent name enough to do well, the Battle of the Belts thing too. Like that's a match that should be on Battle of the Belts. Well, I think that even though they've only they've only named two matches that happen on Battle of the Belts, I assume they'll name another one that happens on Collision. Probably. Uh, but I think that uh, this is at least the most interesting Battle of the Belts has been in a while in terms of potential for either title changes or big things to happen. Maybe they heard the criticism <laughs> and yeah. it's like, well, can we stop having, you know, uh, Eddie Kingston against Trent or something on there? And can we put uh, like, uh, yeah, we got this segment from um, Ricky Starks and Big Bill are going to go up against Chris Jericho and Sammy Guevara. So there's a good chance that the tag titles change hands. I think actually they might. I think they will. They might not really want uh, to necessarily yeah, I, if with the yeah. Jericho thing. <laughs> I think, I, I think that it's died down a little bit. I think that because basically nothing's come off the back of it, like in terms of serious either allegations or anything regarding the people that were implicated in it. So I, I kind of think that like the guy, I don't want to say like he made something up. I think he over exaggerated stuff because he was he was pissed off at Jericho for what he'd said about things. I, so, I'll say this: I, I wish I could say what you just said. I wish I could say yeah. that I felt like. 
Yeah, I, 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 understand, I understand that you can't, and people that actually have like a, a foot in the wrestling in wrestling media couldn't say anything specifically one way or the other without any evidence to back it up. But it does feel like like people aren't being as villain about it. And I also feel like, again, this is just me talking as an individual, just my perspective. I think the people were just jumping on it because they just don't like Chris Jericho. Oh, I, I had mentioned that to some friends where I, I think that people feel a bit more safe in this one where it's yeah, like it's well, they're, they're, when there's smoke there's fire you know that's not like oh, it's the first sure, thing to sure, come out for him for so sure. it's easy to believe in that stuff more so after you've got the january yeah. 6 stuff yeah. and you've got like multiple backstage fights you got the mvp story that he potentially not knocked him out and uh yeah. you know uh, the jericho cruise you've yeah. got like yeah it's you know I'm, eventually I'm certainly, yeah i'm certainly not saying that jericho is a sign and i'm so sure yeah. i'm certain that he's done things in his life and career that like people would that uh typical he should find regrettable but i'd say the 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 whole state of affairs essentially they saw this one opportunity and those people that were already very anti Jericho because of his whether it's political leanings or the fact that he seems to be quote unquote burying people from a like creative standpoint uh, are just just looking just we're just looking for that one opportunity to just like get up on him and to say like yeah fuck this guy it's easier to do that when like if if you're a guy that you already hate but don't have a kind of like real big justification to do it as soon as something like this drops you're just immediately gonna jump towards it so um but yeah we'll see i think it's i think that they'll have uh, the champions retain i just think it's unlikely that they'll do it so immediately afterwards because there'll be a there'll be some sort of storm associated with it even if it does blow over pretty quickly and yeah i think they'll find someone else to win the tag title soon well no so I unfortunately, like I was saying, I, I wish I could say that this thing had blown over. Uh, my my Twitter feed certainly suggests otherwise. I think Jericho and Guevara win it here. I think they lose it to the Bucks. And I think Bucks ding Darby. I think that should be the end game because that, you know, that's that's something special there. Um, Do you think all that happens before Revolution? Why not? You got till March. You got, you got too early March. Yeah. As quick turnaround, I just assume that that probably wouldn't be the case. Hmm. But I mean, I mean it does seem I, like I mean, obviously, we're going to get Young Bucks versus Sting and Darby. So whether it's the titles involved or not, that's happening. I mean, I, I, I think they've seen everything nicely because Jericho is the reason the Bucks left to begin with. The Bucks were owed a championship match to begin with. <laughs> you know, I think you can find a way to get there. I mean, I, I don't think that you need to put the titles in that match. Just because it's already a big enough deal with the Sting like retirement angle, so I don't think you need to incorporate the tag titles into that as well. Um, I think it's cool that they're doing Sting and Darby Allen versus the Bucks. I mean, like, uh, it's all based seemingly from what reports are saying about around the uh, match they had at Forbidden Door, 20, the, the the first Forbidden Door with um, uh, Sting, Darby Allen, and uh, Shingo Takagi versus um, the Bucks and El Fantasmo. Which was like apparently like Sting had more fun in that match than he's had in years, and so he wants to. He thinks that they're the best two to carry him to a very good match at Revolution. Nor they even needs to be a very good match because like Sting could just do like three or four spots, and the crowd would go crazy for him and give him a stand ovation at the end. But Sting fucking <laughs> fell off, a, <laughs> fell from a staging on yeah. Wednesday, like yeah, through a crazy. table, yeah, doing a doing a. Sting a death drop through uh, like, Tate on Hobbs. Have done that in your prime. What are you doing? <laughs> like... Yeah, so I, I think this is a, this will be a, a good way to bow out for him. And like, fundamentally, if there's any tag team that can pull a, a great, great final match out of Sting at in this point in his career, it's the Young Bucks. So, so yeah, I think that I'm I'm down to see that match. It'll be interesting to see because obviously they've announced. Well, I say they've announced it. They haven't actually officially announced it, but they they're seemingly building towards it now, and we're still. A month and a half away from it, so I'd be interested into what they do in the meantime to lead up to it. But um, yeah, as I home, the homecoming episode of AW is kind of just a there wasn't really much progression. I understand that point of view, but I think they they kind of focused in on the fact that they were back in Daly's place and they did some tributes to uh, Brody Lee in both of the eight man matches or eight person tag matches because of the women's match and having NRJ win that one and having Preston Vance win the uh, the other eight man tag. Then they just tried to make it like a 
hey, this is uh, we're we're back here. This is like AEW's home, and let's celebrate some old memories of it rather than do anything that's like really progressing stories that much. Not uh, my favorite episode I've seen, um, or at least what I could see with the really dark lighting. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I mean, then again, I don't care about SmackDown tonight either. So it's not like it's like, well, you know, and everything else is great. And that, so it's, it is what it is. But um, anything happening tonight on SmackDown, by the way? Uh, I don't think that there's anything crazy that they've announced. Nothing crazy outside of the fact that, like, if you think it's crazy that, you know, Grayson Waller is actually having, not Grayson Waller, the guy who's fighting, uh, Cameron Grimes is actually having a match. It's pretty crazy. About time, know, right? They brought him up a year ago. Um, maybe maybe they finally give a name to the LWO offshoot, Garza and Carrillo and Santos or something, maybe? Is it not just Legato Delphin? <laughs> they should just go with that. They already have the trademark for it, but like Bianca's against Bailey. Who cares? It's just a match, you know? And like. <laughs> Randy Orton, or LA Knight, and AJ Styles are going to do something together. I'm assuming that that's going to take up a quarter of the show. And uh, I should care more about that, but I don't because Roman's going to retain at Mania. At, uh, uh, at Mania, too. Yeah. Uh, Roman's going to retain. So I'm already kind of like, all right, you, you proved to me that outside of the Royal Rumble being fun, I don't care about half these I'm stories not, until I, I, Mania. I'm delusional. I'm I'm a Delulu boy, but uh, <laughs> I'm not sold that Roman's retaining. Again, we have a match where he can lose without losing. I think there's something to that. It'd be anticlimactic, but at this point, I don't care. I think there's something to that. Mm. And uh, I think that's it for our hot tags. If we forgot about something, of course, let us know. We'll drop our thoughts in the comments or roll that into next week's hot tags. And as I said before, these pay-per-views are not necessarily going to be things we are covering up on, um, you know, some pay-per-view point post show or anything like that. But the next pay-per-view that we are going to be doing that is Royal Rumble. We got a little bit of time for that in the meantime. And in the meantime for that we've been watching some old ones so go back and check out the 1994 royal rumble that is already up on the site here and the 2004 which is on the five dollar version of the dark cast here not the ten dollar one although the ten dollar one everybody's got access then if you're on the ten dollar tier you've got access to every dark cast that's ever been put out there not just this one and um you know the under the five dollar one and we got another one coming up with the 2014 Royal Rumble. We're going to be watching that next week to commemorate the whole 10 year setup, but also the CM Punk element of that. So more Royal Rumble talk with that. Anything else that happens on SmackDown tonight or these pay-per-views and stuff and Monday Night Raw and, you know, who knows what's happening with the Jinder Mahal situation and everything. We'll talk about that all in the hot tags next week. Hopefully it's a lot of good things to talk about. And um, now hopefully we see you there, of course, but make sure you are subscribed to this YouTube channel or follow us on whatever the other platforms are that you are checking us out. Check out smartoutmoment.com. As always, follow us on Facebook and Twitter at smartoutmoment and be sure to check out fanboysanonymous.com for anything that happens over on the blue brand there of all that geek culture stuff. Linktree that you can find on amangotree.com. We'll have links to the fanboys content and the Smart Out Moment content and everything else under a mango tree so head on over to anthonymango.com or a mango tree.com same thing and follow me at tony mango all over the place and follow robin callum yep you can follow me on twitter at dude fleece you can follow me on instagram at dude fleece and twitter and of course follow my work on fightful and here's callum yeah, you can find me on Twitter at Wigmeister14. Check out the power rankings every Saturday on smartcatmoment.com where I'm ranking the WWE superstars based on their previous week performance. No, Jinder will not be on the power rankings. Uh, <laughs> he didn't wrestle. Not, not this week, anyway. He'll be on he next week when he wins yeah, the championship. Yeah, when he wins the world title. Yeah. <laughs> then we'll be going straight to the top. But then uh, he'd also be picking up points in the Fantasy League, but none of us have him, of course. Uh-huh. Um, Anybody so, want yeah, to pick him up? Over this? <laughs> I think he might have some uh, extra trade or something, right? Yeah. Yeah, but there you have a uh, uh, yeah. So you can follow the fantasy league over on Smart Moment or head to www.fantasyleague.com and check out how our teams performing, who's picking up points, 
as we head towards the Royal Rumble, the next big stopgap for uh, heading to WrestleMania. So, uh, yeah, see how all our teams progressing. Alrighty, everybody, that's it for the hot tags for episode number 632. Thanks as always for listening to us, and we will see you next time. This has been another Smart Cow Moment, and we are being counted out.